Can call to order the regular meeting of the Scarborough Town Council. It is Wednesday, June 21st. This is our regular meeting starting at 7 o'clock p.m. If you would please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance with me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you for joining us, everyone. If we can then move into roll call, item number three. Councilor Donovan? Present. Councilor Rowan? Here. Councilor Foley? Here. Councilor St. Clair? Here. Councilor Hayes? Here. Councilor Cazzo? Here. Chairman Baybine? Present. <coughs> Moving into item number four, general public comments. If there's anybody that would like to speak on the record on any item that is not on tonight's agenda, you are welcome to come to the podium. You do have three minutes to speak. Um, this is your opportunity to talk to the council. Would anybody like to speak? Not seeing any, we'll co close the general public comments and move into item number five, acceptance of minutes for May 17th, 2017 and June 7th, 2017's regular meetings. Is there a motion from the council? So moved. Second. Is there any edits, modifications, or corrections to the clerk? Not seeing any, all in favor? And that is unanimous, thank you. Item number six, our adjustments to the agenda. If there's no objections, I would like to adjust the agenda and take up item number 17-062. 17-063 and 17-064 at the beginning of new business in front of order number 17-060. There's no objections, we'll record that. Thank you. Um, items to be signed, I will go ahead and sign the treasurer's warrants as we go through the meeting. Moving into the first order of public hearings of order number 17-059. It is a seven o'clock public hearing and action on the new request for a food handler's license from Nick Padalano, I apologize if I didn't pronounce that correctly, but doing business as Papa's Produce, located at 451 Payne Road. This has been submitted to us by the town clerk. Is there any uh, public comment on this item? Not seeing any, we'll close the public hearing and uh, the will of the council. So moved. Any comments or questions for the clerk or for anyone? Not seeing any, all in favor? And that is unanimous, thank you. Moving into our old business, order number 17-049. is a second reading on the proposed amendments to chapter 608, Town of Scarborough Fireworks Display Ordinance, section two, definitions, section three, regulations and codes, section four, permit required, section five, application procedure, and section 12, consumer fireworks, as presented by the ordinance committee. Before opening this for public comment, if I could get a uh, quick overview from the ordinance chair. Certainly. Uh, <coughs> chapter 608 is the uh, <coughs> fireworks display ordinance. This deals with uh, those uh, uh, major fireworks uh, displays that might occur uh, uh, around the holidays uh, uh, out at the Speedway. Uh, these are all uh, undertaken by professional fireworks operators. It requires uh, permits from both the town and the state. Uh, and there were some clerical changes to update this ordinance that were brought to our attention, brought to the attention of the Ordinance Committee by uh, Chief Thurlow, uh, primarily the fact that the concept of consumer fireworks as the state statute uh, created that uh, defined term <clears throat> didn't exist when the display fireworks ordinance came into being, so it needed to be inserted into uh, this, uh, uh, into our 608. And so it's really uh, pretty much some clerical cleanups. Thank you, Mr. Donovan. And I'd like to open it up to public <coughs> comment. Anybody that would like to speak on this order, number 049? Not seeing any, we'll close the public comment. And uh, the will of the council, because it is required of action. So moved. Second. Any comments or questions from councilors? Councilor St. Clair. Um, I just want to thank Councilor Donovan for getting this taken care of. Um, we didn't, he did the right thing. We've been working on this for quite a while. Um, and instead of just trying to push this through to get a, you know, a stricter um, ordinance on the books, he took the time, uh, worked with the chiefs, and worked with the um, staff. And I really appreciate it. It's been a pet peeve of mine, and I'm really happy to see it come to the council floor, and I hope it gets everyone's support. Thank you. Any other counselors? Not seeing any other counselors. Um, move approval. I'm uh, not move approval. Um, all in favor? And that is unanimous. Thank you. 
Moving uh, on to order number 17-050, it is second reading on the proposed <coughs> amendments to Chapter 608A, Town of Scarborough Consumer Fireworks Ordinance, Section 4, Use of Consumer Fireworks Restricted, Section 5, Violation and Enforcement, and Section 7, Notice, as presented by the Ordinance Committee. An overview from the Chairman of the Ordinance Committee before public comment, please. Thank you. Uh, this is the third time this has been before the Town Council. We had a first reading, <coughs> public hearing, uh, where we fully discussed it, and now a second reading. So we're really coming to the end of a process. Uh, uh, we're re really only one of a few towns that allows for uh, uh, private consumer fireworks. Uh, our effort at uh, creating an ordinance amendment is to preserve the uh, right to, uh, uh, and privilege to do it in town, but to really materially reduce the impact on neighbors, uh, which we found to be significant. Uh, the major changes are that uh, we're going from five days to four, July the 5th being eliminated. We're going from 12.30 a.m. to 10 p.m. as the finish time uh, for fireworks. We're adding a, a set of guidelines for being a good neighbor uh, to direct people as to how they should be expected to behave, uh, and we're making the homeowner potentially liable uh, for illegal fireworks. Uh, in the course of the uh, uh, sessions we've had previously, and, uh, and emails I received from and discussions I've had with t other town councilors, had a number of good questions asked, and I'll uh, uh, and I've tried to uh, <laughs> provide written answers to the town council members. Uh, and I'm going to read these here rather briefly, since they're not long, to give the public an idea of some of the questions that were asked uh, and the responses that I pro uh, provided. Uh, the first is, is, it, uh, is an unreasonableness standard too uncertain? Uh, the response was that our ordinances are replete with qualitative standards. Law enforcement and code enforcement are asked to use good judgment as a daily part of their responsibilities. This protects people from inappropriate results. Uh, second question, we are one of uh, the few towns that allows fireworks and they can be a real disturbance to neighbors. The guidelines direct users to take the kind of responsible action we would expect of a good neighbor to un uh, avoid unreasonable disturbances. Why make the owner of the property liable? Uh, our police chief has advised us that the enforcement of our ordinance has been difficult because when an officer responds to a complaint, the person who set off the fireworks is hard to identify. Uh, this change increases homeowners' accountability but still leads to an officer's discretion whether to issue a ticket. And I might say uh, our code enforcement people and our police officers are trained to use their discretion as to when it's appropriate and when it's not appropriate, uh, and it all depends on the circumstances that are presented as they investigate a matter. Uh, we, uh, will owner liability potentially uh, uh, penalize landlords unfairly? No, landlords restrict all sorts of things that may not be done on the premises and be assured setting off explosive devices is high on that list. Landlords also commonly hold security deposits for breaches of a rental agreement and can recoup any fines from the security deposit. Lastly, most landlords will likely be aware of the liability risk as a part of normal due diligence. With the 4th of July fast upon us, what should be the effective date of the new ordinance? I would propose an effective date of 30 days from the date of our vote to allow for appropriate notice to the public. To the extent that a 30-day effective date needs to be included at the end of the ordinance, I will make this motion to amend when the matter comes before us. Uh, the last item is Phantom Fireworks asked what notice language should be used by retailers. And one of the provisions in the new law is that retailers in Scarborough need to provide a notice to all people buying fireworks from them that there is a notification process by anyone wishing to set off fireworks in Scarborough, uh, they must notify the fire, uh, fire department. Uh, uh, for consistency's sake, I would suggest we add the following language to the end of the retailer notice section, Roman numeral eight. Quote, the notice shall read, yeah, let's see if we 
can get that back. Uh, the town of Scarborough requires all persons setting off fireworks in Scarborough to file a notification with the town. The form is available at the fire and police stations and online at www.scarboroughmain.org slash department slash fire hyphen rescue. Uh, and I think that's probably the summary. Thank you. Thank you. Any public comments on the order? All right, that's the last time I'm getting up. Um, if there's no public comment, we'll close the public uh, comment section and <coughs> the will of the council. So moved. Thanks. Comments and questions from council? <coughs> council Foley. Um, so I do appreciate the challenges of enforcement. I think it's this is one of those ordinances that no matter what we did, even if we said no fireworks ever, uh, is always going to be, uh, people are still going <laughs> to have fireworks. That's going to be a, a problem. Um, so I'm, I'm glad to see some changes, tightening it up a little bit. Um, I hope we will do a full review uh, to see in a year, you know, what effect, if any, it's had uh, for the PD um, and the other thing I would like to see us do and hear more about is what the plan is for outreach to uh, those who have rental properties so that they can, within that 30-day 30 uh, 30 time frame, update their rental agreement so that the liability would then fall on the renter instead of the land, uh, property owner, per se. Um, so I hope we can do significant outreach to that end. That's it. But I support overall. I support the changes. Any other questions or comments? Councilor Hayes. I guess just a comment and a question. Um, I would echo, I, I <clears throat> know a lot of work has gone into this. I appreciate the response to the questions. I share counselors fully if, if we just have a commitment that we'll check back in about a year's time to see if, if it's working and make any adjustments that's appropriate, that'd be great. And then second question was just a point of order. Was it, were you going to propose an amendment, Councilor Donovan? So whatever that fits in the process, that, that would be great. Great. Any other questions or comments? <coughs> Yes, sir. I, I completely agree with the idea that uh, we check back after a year. We need to know whether we're going to keep this ordinance uh, as we uh, make an attempt to be able to bring it within some control uh, or whether we're going to have to get rid of this ordinance. Uh, and so those council members who are suggesting that we do a careful review, I think the ordinance committee completely agrees with that and, and would be uh, interested in pursuing that. Uh, outreach to brokers, rental agreements, to the public at large. <clears throat> I think our communications committee uh, w could probably develop a proposal that would allow the public uh, to be made aware of this. By having a 30-day delay in implementation, we get by the 4th of July, and we have a period of time to be able to educate the public. Um, so I have uh, just a simple qu um, question I have is uh, to the counselor. Um, when will you be proposing the amendment? Is this part of this particular motion? Yes. Okay. So I just have a question in general, and it's more around the guidelines. So I do appreciate the explanation you gave around the definition of unreasonableness. And I'm going to use an example, not to necessarily put anybody in the community, and, but I have a constituent that I hear from. Um, I actually like most of these guidelines. The problem that I have isn't the interpretation that the police use, but it's the interpretation that the citizens have regarding that. So when you sit there and say, a comment such as um, could unreasonably disturb your neighbors, um, that can vary from neighbor to neighbor, and um, as well as the peaceful enjoyment, because I have a constituent that is highly asthmatic. Her neighbor, use, uh, her, uh, her neighbor um, sets fires, or not sets fires, <laughs> has a fire pit, um, and um, because of that, and she follows these rules, but yet she gets no response, and she does not, or is unable to be peacefully enjoyed um, at our own home. So how do you balance that? And I get nervous when you put qualitative statements like that into an ordinance that is so highly uh, divisive across the board, depending on who interprets it. So I'm actually still comfortable, though, in approving it, um, understanding that there's an agreement that we're going to look at this in a year, because that's the part that I want to understand better, because that, it should apply not only to this ordinance, uh, but maybe it should also apply to uh, dogs on the beach, uh, setting fires or having a fire pit, um, other things that can intrude onto the peacefulness of another person um, and how it's being enforced. So, I'll um, I, just not to, um, I'm not speaking for Councilor Donovan, but I, I know the person that you're referencing. Um, 
an ordinance two years ago, Tom and I actually worked with her yeah. trying to figure out a way and with the police um, and fire chief trying to figure out how to best accommodate her yeah. without, I mean, her, her neighbor's solution was sell your house and leave. And that to me was a, not a very nice thing to say to someone. Um, and she has a very proven track record that that smoke is detrimental to her health. Um, and so I feel like with the implementation of the good neighbor policy and with the changes that we're making with this, that hopefully that this is help, going to help back her up with some of her issues. So I, I'm hoping that with some of these changes that we're starting to make, she's going to have a stronger case for um, being able to live outside a little bit more than she does, or even live in her own home. Sure. Any other comments? Whenever you create a right in the public to do something that really has the potential to be uh, very disturbing to neighbors and others in the community, I think you really need to protect the other people in the, uh, in the neighborhood. Uh, and that's really what uh, I think we're trying to come yeah. down on the side of making people make a judgment. Is this appropriate for where I live? Uh, or should I just pass on this and maybe do it in another location or in other circumstances? So I do think that we'd like to preserve it, but not, not at the cost of, of uh, the hundreds of concerns that we've heard expressed. I just want to ask all the counselors if we can really make an effort to speak into our mics. I, I think we have, I don't know, a few people are having some hard time hearing. So uh, that would be helpful. That's all. Nothing to do with fireworks. Uh, if I may, I'd like to make the first of two mo uh, motions to amend. Absolutely. Uh, the first uh, is that uh, the effective date of the adoption of this ordinance will be 30 days after uh, tonight's vote. Is there a second? Second. The amendment? Second. second. Comments or questions? Not seeing any, all in favor? And that is unanimous. Your second amendment, sir? The second is to uh, the uh, retailer notice section, Roman numeral uh, eight, uh, and uh, it shall have the added language, quote, the town of Scarborough requires all persons uh, excuse me, the, uh, the notice shall read, quote, the town of Scarborough requires all persons setting off fireworks in Scarborough to file a notification with the town. The form is available at the fire and police stations and online at www.scarboroughmain.org slash departments backslash fire hyphen rescue. Is there a second? Second. second. Comments or questions regarding the motion? Not seeing any, all in favor of the amendment. And that is unanimous. Any other amendments? Not seeing any, we're back to the main motion. Is there any other comments or questions on the main motion as amended? Not seeing any, all in favor of the main motion as amended. That's uh, unanimous, thank you. Order number 17-052 is the second reading on the request for discontinuance of a portion of Beach Ridge Road and schedule a public hearing as. Sorry, there should be the public hearing. I'm sorry. I'm sorry? This just should be a second reading. Oh, okay. Sorry, um, apologize. This is just um, a second reading on the request for discontinuance of a portion of Beach Ridge Road um, as recommended by the town engineer. Would the town engineer like to provide any overview before we open the public comments? <coughs> This is the third time this has been in front of you, so I'm just going to do it this very briefly. Uh, Beach Ridge Road is a very wide right of way, and that is um, the property that we're talking about at 41 Beach Ridge Road is right next to the turnpike. And so over time, as the turnpike bridge overpass was relocated, um, that right of way got widened on the other side. Um, so what it leaves now is a very wide, 150 foot wide right away in this location. It does bend and narrow back down. Um, and so what we're looking at um, is a hardship by the Williams family in wanting to rebuild a house that was burnt down um, recently. And because it is a non-conforming use, because of the setbacks that this leaves, uh, staff has been working with them and putting this in front of you 
to discontinue just a portion of it. So it, it still leaves us with ample right of way to do our operations and Public Works um, has reviewed this and the applicants are here as well if anybody has any further questions. Any questions from the Council for the Engineer? Chiazzo? Have we heard anything from neighbors at all or? Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, yes, since we've been in front of um, you, I have heard from the neighbor um, the abutting property, uh, Pamela Dillon, will be coming through with a similar request. Um, hers is less, well I shouldn't say less of a hardship. The, the, what the applicants in front of you tonight um, need to rebuild their house. The applicants that will be coming forward next are looking at expanding a uh, front deck um, where it has ample room out front, it just comes down to this wide right of way, it, it hinders their ability to build what they want to build. Councilor St. Clair. Um, Sean, if it's okay, um, it, to Councilor Chiazzo's point, um, I also received email, I'm not sure if everyone did, but from Dale McConnell, who said that he was um, a neighbor, he's at 100 Beechridge Road, so I'm not sure how close that is, but he wanted to let us know that he does agree with it and feels as though we should be supporting this. Um, and he goes on to explain why, but he says he is in favor of granting this to them. Uh, just for a clarification, I believe that was Dale Tem at 100 Beaches Road. It sure. says McConnell on my thing, but. Oh no, you're right, I'm sorry. I, and it is, um, Tem is, it is a, uh, and my apologies. Um, and that's Mrs. Dale Tem, Mrs. Tem. Yeah. Okay, so no, two <laughs> apologies. <laughs> I'm very sorry, yeah, Mrs. Mrs. Dale Tem. I think maybe her McConnell is maybe her maiden name. It is. No, I don't know. So I got something yeah. right. Yeah. 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 Uh, how many properties again are, are would right. be impacted by this if right. we Thanks. we were going to look right. at this in bulk mm -hmm. and because of the sense of urgency we're pushing and, this? And I apologize, I did not probably put in your packet the aerial that I had the first time around, but um, it pretty much widens from the turnpike and then there's a bend in the road which would impact probably up to three properties. Really it's this property, the one coming forward probably next, and then it goes to a triangle where it tapers back to the original right of way. I buy it all the time. Thank you. No, it's impacted. It's impacted. Good. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, with that explanation and questions, are there any public comments? <coughs> any public comments? Not seeing any. Um, a motion from the council. So moved. Second. Any questions or comments from council? Is the reason we're not looking at the whole doing the whole thing at once because of the time sensitivity? Is that it? The Williams came forward yeah, and they do have to no, uh, and typically the discontinuance is initiated by, um, by a, a property owner. Uh, it may not have to be that way, but typically that's the way it comes forward. Okay. I'm just wondering if it's just wasting our time to revisit if two more property owners are going to have the same request and it makes a lot of sense because my understanding is there's no, it, it's just those three. Yeah, that's but a anyway. fair point. We can make some outreach to the to the other affected properties to see if there's. I mean, we can go ahead with this portion of it and then make sure we do the other two yeah. at the same time, so that we're not. Great. Any other comments or questions from council? Not seeing any. All in favor? And that is unanimous. Thank you. And as I as I um, um, made notice at the beginning, we will take uh, three items out of order or adjustments. We will next take up um, item number 17-062. It is on the reverse side of the agenda if you are looking at that. And just for future, uh, we will also take next after that 17063 and then 17064 before 17060. Um, the order number 17-062 is an act on the request to certify the results from the June 13th school board validation referendum and the municipal referendum as um, submitted by the town clerk. And let me get my document. I apologize. And do I need to? Uh, I don't know. Do I need to read anything? <laughs> yeah. I grab the wrong one. I'm going to get it from the back side. Yep. Um, so I'm just going to. I'm not going to read the entire narrative, but I will at least read the results. Um, so the results for the Tuesday, June 13th election. Uh, referendum uh, question was on the municipal referendum on the fueling station, the yes votes were 3,021, no votes were 1,160, there were 54 blanks, the yes votes 
uh, carried the referendum. The school budget validation referendum, the yes votes were 1,822, the no votes were 2,408, and there were seven blanks. There was approximately 16,851 active voters on our voter registration list for this election. It does not include the same day registrations. There were 4,237 voters who cast ballots in the June 13th election. There were 1,436 absentee ballots issued, of which 1,401 were accepted and processed. The percentage of voter turnout for this election was 25%. And is there any public comment on the item? Not seeing any public comment. Um, is there a motion from the council? So moved. Second. Any comments or questions from the council? Yes, ma'am. Um, so I was going to save this for later because I wanted to start with good news, but I'll say it now because it's relevant to this particular piece. Uh, I think a 25% turnout, while low in, in relation to, you know, let's say the presidential uh, turnout and vote, if you compare to other towns, I think, you know, South Portland only had 5.9% people turn out for their full budget vote. Uh, Cape Elizabeth only had a 13% turnout. So in general, to have almost double that show show up at the polls um, thing tells me that people are at least paying attention and that we have increased engagement. Uh, whether we would like the results of that engagement is a whole different uh, topic, but I'm, I'm, I'm happy that that's the case, that other towns could be aspiring to get more people to the polls for their school budget. And uh, just to add to that, if I remember correctly, looking at the totals, we even beat the city of Portland by about 100 votes. Hmm. It speaks volumes. <coughs> And, and you're saying gross percentage. numbers, not percentage. percentage. Gross huh? numbers. In, in gross numbers. Yeah, gross yeah, numbers. Yeah. Yeah. Any other comments or questions? Not seeing any. All in favor of accepting the results. And that is unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Order number 17-063 <coughs> is a first reading and schedule a public hearing and the second reading on fiscal year 2018's municipal and school budget. And um, let me just grab that right up to get us started. Um, I, I'm, I apologize. Actually, if I could open that up to any public comments. Is there anybody that would like to speak on the item? You do have three minutes. Good evening, everyone. Ben Howard, Seven Windsor Pines. 7.4%. Everyone saw it and understood it, and that was the number that really mattered. I understand that really the school budget only increased by 3.38%, but the tax burden on Scarborough would have been 7.2% on this town, which I think would have been unjust had it passed. Um, that be, uh, unjust is that being passed. I understand that the state took money from us, but even two weeks ago, one of the counselors was stated as saying that they expected the state to come through with money. Had we got that money, would we have returned it to the citizens after hitting them for this large, substantial amount of money in their taxes? I don't know. It has yet to be seen. As a whole, I don't think the slow incremental increases of school budget is really a sustainable uh, practice any longer. As I've stated before, with the amount of online free education that there exists, there will be a business model that comes in, comes in hard and just obliterates what is already presented here before us. It exists in two forms. In the private sector, we have the University of Phoenix or even colleges such as the University of Southern New Hampshire, which has online education. Elsewhere, in the state school systems, we have SAD districts, which is a collection of towns that come together to pay a teacher. So let me paint a picture here of a quick little business model here. Let's say um, I'm a guy and I come to you and I come to this town and I say, hey, I have the 10 best teachers in the country, all PhDs. Here's the test scores of the students here. Um, they're all passing with flying colors. Guess what? Um, to add to that, I will also uh, allow you um, since you've already built these school districts, I'll give one-on-one -on -one tutoring to a lot of the students that ask for it. So the students can tune into live lectures, comment, question as the lecture is going on and moderators will answer them. 
live. Or they can tune in later and rewatch a broadcast to relearn a lesson, anything along those lines. And if they really want some extra education, we have schools and we have tutors there for you. That's just the proposed model. As we know from the budget here, uh, teachers make up about 70% of the school budget, which is fair as it is educating the future. But if I'm able to cut the number of teachers, I'm going to severely cut the budget down to a more manageable price. Now, for an example of a business that was state-run and could ask for state money, you have the U.S. Postal Service, which was founded at the inception of this country. And to ever think that a private industry would be able to deliver private mail from my house to my neighbor's house without opening it, that the idea was astronomical. But today, who delivers your mail on Saturday and Sunday? It's not FedEx or UPS anymore. It's the U.S. Postal Service because they are no longer making money. Again, finally, I really ask, why do we need to continue to increase the budget? Because it doesn't seem to result in better grades for students. If we look at um, statistics from, sorry, the National Center for Education Statistics, the United States spends $11,800 per full-time equivalent, equivalent uh, student of an elementary school or a secondary education, which is 28% higher than the OECD average of $9,200. Yet, we still rank very poor in those same metrics used for education. To me, it doesn't seem that adding more money to the school district is really going to solve the problem of poor test scores. Maybe it's something else. Maybe we need to develop a new education model or change things in how they are done. I'm just saying, as time has gone on, humans have always adapted and changed, and that is what made us so successful. So don't get stuck in the old ways that teaching needs to be done in only in the classroom. But there are other opportunities and other ways out there. So please, as we look forward here and look to the budget, look to other places, more creative places to save money. Thank you. Good evening, Kelly Murphy, Five Woodfield Drive, and Chair of the School Board. I would just like to take a minute to remind the Council and the public, which the Council already knows, that 7.4% was actually the portion of the municipal tax dollars and increase that would go to schools this year. The actual um, approximate estimated tax increase for property owners' tax bills was 3.5%. And we did have a, um, already make, the, make it very clear that 50% of any additional dollars from the state uh, would go to reduce the tax burden this year and the other 50% would go to the um, fund for next year, hoping to offset any increase. Um, I just want to remind us that we cannot underestimate the importance of public education, live and in person, and um, we are not stuck in the past. Our schools are incredibly innovative and updated and nothing like schools of even 10 years ago. So the value of education is worth it, um, and I hope our town can support us. Thank you. Hello, I'm Hugh Morgenbesser. I live at Two Hope Lane. Um, so, uh, a few things. So, first of all, um, uh, thank you for noticing the increased turnout at the election. And it's kind of complicated. Some of the towns that have quieter turnout, that often means a little bit less of a conflict and a little bit less. So, the, the increased turnout, I, I really am disappointed that there weren't even more people, but also is an indication of just sort of maybe the, so the things that drive people to the polls in some cases are, um, are fear and, uh, and, divi di and a disagreement. And, and so uh, there were, as you noticed, uh, some signs around town uh, emphasizing the 7.4% number. And I think that a lot of people misinterpreted that number. And whether or not it was intentionally misleading or accidentally misleading, a lot of people may have cast their vote for no thinking that they were voting against a 7.49% increase in their taxes, not merely a 7.49% increase in one portion of the taxes. So 
I think that the results of the election need to be taken in the context of what messages were sent out and what might have brought people to the polls. That said, I'm still disappointed that more people didn't come out in favor of, uh, of the correct actual increased taxes that would have been implied by the passing of the budget. So I would encourage everyone in this town to realize that, that uh, although there was a clear mandate by the people who came to, the, uh, to those vote, voting booths that day that 7.49% was too high of a tax increase, they didn't really tell us what they felt about a 3.5% tax increase. The, um, I also read uh, one comment just suggesting that we run our town like a business, which of course we have to make our ends meet, which is why we do have to adjust uh, the budget and adjust the taxes. But I also think we need to remember that this town is an investment. And we are, many of us are investors in the form of real estate owners, others are investors in, as parents, and we all have a, a lot at stake here. And uh, the quality of the schools is a critical component of whether or not our investment is going to go up in value and be, and be something to treasure, or if it's going to go down in value. And there's many, many pieces of evidence that I'm not going to cite right now that really correlate the success of, a, of, a, of that, those investments along with the success of the schools. So anyway, I'm really asking that you uh, remember the importance of my personal investment as well as the rest of the towns when we balance not just the cost, the short-term costs, but also the, the importance of what happens to the things that we've invested in, we've already put forth. The, um, there's other uh, aspects. I had one more point, but I'm just going let to it, let it go. Anyway, <laughs> thank you very much, and um, I look forward to hearing uh, what, what happens. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Tom Heels from uh, Fort Junebury Lane. I'm a retiree in this town, been here 10 years. And I just have uh, three points to kind of uh, ask uh, everybody around here. Uh, I've worked in uh, three levels, the state, uh, federal, and local level of, the, uh, of government. And every place that I've worked, the salaries have been an open, uh, open for uh, inspection by the public. And I don't know why the salaries uh, in Scarborough of the teachers are not made public. That's, that's a mystery to me. Uh, number two, with the declining school population, uh, wouldn't you think it might be possible to close a school such as Pleasant Hill School and sell it for condos or something, get some money there, and uh, put those children in another school and consolidate them in another school. And the other thing is, uh, the last thing I want to point out is, uh, with the school uh, people, the, the board or the, or the people that work in the school department, you know, crunching numbers 40 hours a week, uh, there's no way the public can, can do that 40 hours a week and ever understand what's, what's being presented to the public. It's just totally impossible. There's too many figures, and, and the public just, just doesn't understand it. I certainly don't, and that's why I'm here, to try to understand it. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Good evening. Jean Marie Katarina, 311 Gorham Road. Um, I wasn't going to speak, but I thought I'd just put out a couple of points. Um, particularly regarding turnout, while we may have had 25% turnout, um, <clears throat> what's interesting is in the other towns that had smaller turnout, they did pass their school budgets. I do believe that we're the only town around here who didn't or had an issue with that, which I find concerning because to me it shows a real lack of community in Scarborough, which I find discouraging. Um, it's over and over again, year after year, I see us pitting our future, our children, against older uh, taxpayers, homeowners, and I don't find that helpful. Uh, and what I really find unhelpful was I, I thought those 7.4% signs were quite misleading um, and would give people the impression that, you know, their taxes were going up 7.4%, but that being said, 
um, what's more discouraging to me is I have heard nothing from those who oppose the school budget as to what they would find acceptable. Nothing. Um, and there was an article in the paper recently where um, one of the supporters of the no movement basically said, oh, I, you know, well, I don't know, it's up to the town council. So mm, come on, folks. Uh, let's work together. Let's try to put uh, a budget together that makes sense. And I, <laughs> I get so tired of trying to explain year after year after year, why is it that Scarborough can't pass a school budget? It's very discouraging. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments from the public? <coughs> One more time, anybody else? <coughs> Not seeing any, we're going to close the public comment and have council uh, discussion. Um, what I'd like to do in trying to uh, keep this kind of orderly, because uh, um, I did get a chance to watch our second reading, and I want to make sure that uh, I do a better job for you and that we all are very clear in our conversation. I'd like to start off first by asking the manager if he could give us an overview of the process in which we are uh, to this point, um, and then uh, maybe turn it over to the superintendent for an update regarding the school department uh, and the school board, um, and maybe can answer a couple of questions and give us some information. I know that you recently did a survey. so. I'd like to go through this very uh, patiently and methodically. Sure. I'd love to provide just a little bit of context. So just over a week ago, the vote occurred. So from my perspective, that's kind of breakneck speed. I think uh, there was a fairly clear direction from at least members of finance committee who convened on Thursday night that there was interest in kind of getting right back to business. And what that means for us from a practical point of view is that the council still needs to go through its normal adoption process first reading, public hearing, second reading, and then of course scheduling another school validation vote. All of that takes time. Um, and so there was an interest and I really hadn't heard much complaint about getting started, which is why we're uh, doing it this evening. What that really means for practical terms is needing to, to um, take a position as soon as last Friday. And this was a really kind of a dynamic process. And I think it may be helpful for members of council and the public just to understand kind of how the order in front of you this evening is postured and, and perhaps why. Um, essentially, uh, I was approached, and this is not uncommon, a counselor was interested in having the town share in the responsibility to make this next step, which seemed like a very reasonable uh, uh, response. And over the course of Friday morning and early Friday afternoon, I heard another, a number of other inputs from counselors that that seemed to be uh, kind of a consensus emerging. and so. Frankly, I lobbied pretty hard with council chair to say that let's put this, let's start this in that direction if that's where the council um, is likely to go. Let's not make it any more complicated. So, uh, and beyond that, uh, the positioning and the posturing really is in line with exactly how we've conducted ourselves over the last four months. Uh, this one town, one budget, sharing in the responsibility and getting to a different and ideally a better place. So that really explains as to why we're starting and frankly you need a starting point. And do keep in mind uh, this is first reading, it's a starting point and the options are wide open to you at this point. <coughs> I appreciate all of your input over the last 36 hours or so in terms of likely amendments and I have uh, spent a lot of time trying to understand how we can do this in an orderly fashion. Uh, the one thing that's clear to me is that there's I don't think any perfect magic recipe as to how to get to the end. There are a lot of opinions uh, around how to do that. And I think the challenge for the council chair and you as a, as a body is to, is to walk yourselves through that tonight. And to that end, I've suggested the council chair take a bit of an unconventional process uh, to try to identify, at least initially, some of the bigger picture kind of through consensus. Um, and then we can fall back and do it by formal amendment. So. Uh, it will be interesting to see how that unfolds and I, I very much appreciate your patience as we go through that. I think it may be helpful for the superintendent to provide uh, an update uh, preliminarily at this point. Sorry. To, Chair, just, just as a point of clear, I, I would like the record to reflect what's in the document here says the finance committee voted that this ought to pass. Um, both the dates which we did talk about at the Finance Committee, but it implies that we also approve the motion that's attached, which we did not discuss at the Finance Committee meeting. Sure. So, so let's be clear, this, this was ought to pass for the date. It was not a Finance Committee recommendation. Yes. We didn't address it at all. 
about the motion that you see in the document okay. that we're going to be discussing tonight. I just yes. want the record to be clear. Absolutely correct. Sorry, I did not catch that. You can Absolutely. insert either the town manager or perhaps the council chair in place of the finance committee if that pleases you. You're exactly I, I, right. I just want it to be the record to be clear. It wasn't a fine. It wasn't even discussed at the finance committee meeting. So That's correct. <coughs> correct. Whatever is correct needs to be correct. Yep. Thank you. And if I could also ask, maybe just to keep for record keeping, the next order of 064 regarding the timeline was also not voted on, so therefore that ought to pass to be stricken as well, even though it was discussed. This one? Yes. yes. But thank you. I should have called that ahead. My, my I just, fine. Um, so I, I just wanted, um, before I turn it over to the superintendent, I do want to mention uh, regarding the process, and that is that. Um, as chair, um, while Tom is gracious in explaining and, and taking some responsibility in this, is that um, I am the one that approves the motion, um, and I hope that people understand. Uh, first, I, I deplore the fact that there is an insinuation that somehow there is some type of um, um, situation going on behind the scenes, and I'm trying to craft something, because that is not true. I would never use this position to do that. The fact is the motion that is on the floor is consistent with what was given in 2015 in which we are dealing with the same thing. And that's how and why the motion was crafted the way it was. It had no other ulterior motives. Um, it was about getting the work done and moving it forward. So I appreciate everyone's consideration with that. Um, I hope that resolves any confusion. And I'd like to turn it over to the superintendent for any update from the school department. Do you want to project? Can you connect remotely? I don't know if I can connect here. Can you do it here and I'll get the screen ready? Do I need to move? use this type of adapter you have to have the, uh, unfortunately automatic. Okay. this okay. is what happens when Kelly's not here <laughs> <laughs> okay so the results um, being preliminary perhaps you can at least speak to them yeah absolutely so um, thank you for the opportunity to, to speak tonight and to share a little bit about why the survey was put out there and then also what the preliminary results are showing um, I thought it was really important to gain as much knowledge and understanding as we could after the failed vote to really understand you know, who actually came out to vote, what level was the confusion, did folks have the right information, how can we improve? Um, since I've been here, I've been so impressed with the desire of the town council and the school board and the town manager to really educate the community. I, um, this is my first experience having so much transparency with the community. Having been in two other um, districts in two different states, it was n this much information was not produced and, and put out there for the public. And so given that some folks still felt like they didn't have enough information, you know, frankly, that surprised me. And so um, for me, I like to get to the why and understand as best we can. So we created a quick and dirty survey, I'm going to call it, um, meaning that it's not a scientific survey. I created it myself using Google Forms um, so that it could be efficient and timely. And so um, these results, I think it's important for us all to understand the limitations of doing a survey that's self-created in this way. Um, in order for everyone in the community to have access to it, we wanted it to be anonymous. And so um, Initially, I think it was collecting people's uh, email addresses and we corrected that once folks um, noted that that was happening. And also, it, initially we were limiting one response per respondent, which meant that you would have to have a Google sign-in and password in order to access the survey. And again, wanting to have um, as much, we wanted to have open access for an entire community. We made those adjustments along the way. So if you've tried to respond and you found difficulty, please try again because those things have been corrected. So. So far to date, we've had 634 responses. Um, and what I did was just try to break that down by stakeholder group. Um, and so, so far to date, 63.4% of the people who have responded to the survey, which 
some are rolling in right now as I speak. Um, 63.4% were residents who have students currently enrolled in the Scarborough Public Schools. 18.4% are Scarborough residents who are 55 plus. 11% um, are residents who do not have any school age children and 1.6% were residents who um, do not have any children enrolled in Scarborough Public Schools but have school age to children and then 5.6% were other. And so a lot of people were putting kind of individual comments that as I go through, once the survey code, or once the survey closes, I'll go through and I'll code some of those other responses because they do actually fit into some of the other categories. So again, keeping in mind that this is preliminary data, um, I have been doing a rolling analysis. And so what that means is I look at it multiple times a day. So as the data is coming in, I'm recognizing how the results are shifting based on the respondents. Um, and that's you know, a type of analysis that is commonly used. So of the, of the 634 people who had responded at the time I analyzed this data this afternoon, 85.2% of them said that they voted on Tuesday and 14.8% said that they did not vote. And so it was really important to us that we understood both why folks were voting and why folks were not voting. Um, and so one of the questions that was asked was, if you did not vote, why? And so of um, 97 people who said they didn't vote chose to respond to this question, which was an optional question. <coughs> and the top three reasons were, number one, <coughs> I support the schools but couldn't bring myself to vote for a tax increase. That's 32% of the people who, um, who did not vote said, I just, I couldn't even support any tax increase. <coughs> so these are people who did not come to the polls. 5.2%, um, the second most popular response was because they were out of town. And then 4.1% uh, responded that I didn't vote because I didn't think it mattered. And so that to me is important information. I can already, I'm already thinking about um, strategies for our second vote, but also for FY19 and making some clarification about maybe early voting options um, and absentee voting options for folks I think is some good work that we could do to make improvements there. This also tells me that um, no matter how much we reduce the budget, there's a certain um, there's certain constituent groups within our community who just aren't going to be able to support any sort of increase and I think that's important information for us to have as well. <clears throat> when asked if you voted and supported the budget, why did you support the budget, um, there were really two clear um, top answer, two top answers that were really clear of the 401 people who answered this question, 80.5% said that they understood that the tax increase would be 3.49% and they felt that that was reasonable. And that was the majority. 15.3% um, said that they were unclear on what the tax increase was, but they voted to support the schools anyway. Um, and then again, there were lots of one-off responses that as I go through and clean the data, I will be able to code into one of the, in some of the other categories. Um, people decided to type in some of their own responses, like, um, I'll just give you a couple examples because there's several. Um, one person chose to type in and say, I generally support the schools and what they ask for, but re remain concerned about long-term impact of increases, in, increasing expenses and lack of state funding. So that's really good information, I think, as well. I, and I think that's a, an issue or a concern that we all share. Um, Others put in comments such as like, I support our future, um, or I hoped, I hoped the tax was the best the town could do. I, it still was too high, but I supported the budget. Um, because uh, another response was because the education system is the most important part of our community. And so I think even reading those individual responses, it gives you a lot of information about the pulse in our community, and that's important for us to look closely at. Um, the next question was if you voted and did not support the budget, why? And so there were 157 survey respondents who um, answered this question. 47.1% of these folks said that they knew the tax rate was estimated to, to be at 3.49% and they still felt that that was too high. 26.8% um, said I'm against any increase at all and that's why I didn't support the budget. And the third most popular response 
12.7% um, of these 157 respondents said that the red signs that stated 7.4% increase around town influenced their vote. Um, and then again, in this, to this question, there were lots of even more actually one-off responses. Um, um, some of them were not happy about the lack of ability to live in within our means. Others said that the 3.49% was misleading. The real number is 7.4%. Informed voters need to know based on the actual numbers. Um, others said, I believe you should hold, um, you should hold any school budget increases to less than 2.5%. So lots of ideas and suggestions from folks here. Um, others said things that um, I read I read that the town was going to borrow six million to balance the budget and I don't approve of borrowing to meet the current expenses. So again, I think that these, one, these are just one singular responses from individuals, but I think that um, analyzing those further is going to help us really understand our community better. And again, that's the goal, right, is to really understand, you know, what, what, can, our, what can our community support. <coughs> The next question was how could we best communicate and share accurate information with you prior to the next vote? Um, in the top three responses, every, every person answered this, so at the time it was 634 responses. The number one um, form of communication at 77.3% was to publish information in the Scarborough Leader. The second uh, most suggested form of communication was Facebook at 53.6%. And then the third was to mail information to my house. And so this, um, the numbers aren't going to add up to 100% because people could check, you know, the, the ways that they think that we should best communicate. So there is some overlap there. But when you look at the raw data, you can see, um, you know, how, how that correlates in each response. So I think that um, we have been using the Scarborough Leader and plan to continue to use that and really just thinking about how to get that information out just in time. I think one of the challenging things for me to our, the gentleman who spoke earlier is that it is really complex. The school budget is, is very, very complex and there's lots of factors that influence it and lots of moving parts. Um, even as we work together to get to uh, a tax, an estimated tax rate that we hope our community can support the next time around, I'm going to have, I have new information today that I didn't have last Tuesday. Uh, I'm sure I'll have additional information again prior to the actual vote when we set that date. And so that's uh, something that I wish was different, but it just isn't. Um, and so that's where we do our best at looking at, you know, history and trying to project and predict. And, you know, Kate Bolton is really a fantastic business manager who's able to do that really, really well. Um, and so I love when people suggest, like, you know, just put out a little one-pager. And I would have to tell you that just in the last week alone, everybody's little one pager is really specific and it's really different what data matters to them and what they want to see. So I am committed to continuing to work with our leadership council and our community to find out like what is that little one pager because I'd love for it to be able to sit on a postcard and everybody in the community be crystal clear about what is happening within the, the budget. It just is more complex than that. But one thing I will say, because I love coffee, and if you give me a call, I will definitely sit and have a cup of coffee with you and explain it to you to the point where you'll probably be like, great, thanks, I'm ready to go. Um, and I'll <laughs> still be talking as you walk out the door. Um, so I, I extend that to anyone in our community um, because I really do think that it's important for you to have a deep understanding. Um, 205 people who responded to the survey also provided additional comments, and these are very, very insightful. Um, each one has a different point that they're making. And uh, to me, I feel like I'm really hearing and, and the voices of our community when I'm reading these. So again, this is part of my rolling analysis. It doesn't come up in a nice little pie chart. Um, it's way more complex to read this type of qualitative data, but it still is um, important and informative. So I plan to continue to do this rolling analysis over the next few days. We're going to keep the survey open until Monday, the 21st. Um, 
And then, you know, I will fully analyze all of the comments once the survey is concluded and make targeted improvements to the way we're communicating um, prior to the next vote. But already, believe it or not, I'm thinking about FY19 and thinking about what's going to be our communication strategy um, and how do we hear what our community is telling us and respond in a really respectful way and responsible way. So that's the survey in a nutshell. Um, I don't know if there's any questions you want me to answer specifically about that. I think just the last thing I would say is remember, this is not meant to be a scientific process. It's meant to hear our community and create another way for our, um, our constituents to have voice in the process. Any questions regarding the survey? I actually have a couple of questions, but not about the survey. Yes, just a quick question. I mean, the, the survey is now available to everybody in town, right? So it's not... It is available to everybody in town. Um, we wanted to get it out right away, so it initially went to parents um, through email, like Friday folder type of stuff does, but it's also on the school website and on the town website, and we want you know everyone in the community to have full access. Thank you. It, also, I would say if you prefer a printed copy, just call central office and we can make sure that you get that. Um, and we're looking to put some printed copies at the library as well. Any other questions on the survey? I have two, um, so it's a custom that uh, we've tried over the last couple of years to answer questions that do arise from the experts. So there were two questions from citizens that I thought that you might be able to answer. The first was uh, regarding um, um, access to um, n understand or know what salaries are uh, regarding employees, and I was wondering if you could comment on that. The second question um, was around, or it might not have been a question, but I think an update regarding long-range planning because there was a comment about uh, school consolidation and I was wondering just briefly maybe just to, for the citizen that asked it, who is here he could get an answer on those two issues. Sure. So um, all of our salary information is public information, uh, so you can request that in detail, but also all of our collective bargaining agreements that outline the, pay, um, the salary schedules for staff are available on our website currently. Um, so you can see them for every single uh, bargaining group in, in our district. As far as the long-range planning, um, the enrollment is lower than it was years ago. But the idea that the enrollment is declining is not actually an accurate statement. Um, at my last look at the enrollment data from last June to this June, we actually have 80 more students. And so it's, it's lower than it was three years ago, but we're, what we're seeing is that our current enrollment actually is exceeding the projections that were done. So as part of our long-range planning, we partnered with an organization called Planning Decisions who did two types of enrollment analysis for us. Um, one is called the best fit model, and then the other is called the new housing model. And the new housing model um, is based on the current development in our community. And so um, both of these are very thorough, professionally done analysis that are available also on our website, but I'm happy to talk it through with anyone um, who's interested in that level of detail. This is something that I monitor closely. It's actually the first thing that we look at when we started the budget process this year back in November. Um, I, had all, I had taken all of our current enrollment data and basically projected for the uh, upcoming school year. And then we talked about class sizes and we looked at personnel um, and did a really thorough analysis of that. Right now, I believe we're 60 <coughs> students higher than what the best housing or the new housing model projected us to be at the end of this year. And so if that trend continues, we'll actually be, um, we'll be uh, increasing enrollment over the next 10, 10 years, I believe, is, is what it goes out. So in terms of consolidating a school, I think the tricky thing to understand is that you might notice, oh, there's 10 less kids or there's 20 less kids. Um, and unless there's 10 less kids in one grade, in one building, there is no real cost savings there. Um, we have to have a pretty significant in, um, enrollment decline in order to be able to offer one section less or um, to close a school, certainly there would have to be hundreds of kids that we, our enrollment would have to decline by hundreds of kids in a specific grade band, like kindergarten, first and second grade. Um, we're fortunate in Scarborough that our intermediate school is all in one building, our middle school is all in one building, and our high school is all in one building. We are challenged by having three small K-2 schools. It doesn't allow us to be as efficient as we could because of just the fact that we're spread across three schools. Um, 
but it doesn't warrant us to close a school at this time, then we would be exceeding capacity and be creating unsafe conditions for our students. So I um, share that that frustration with you, and if, um, if I could have it my way, we would be building a consolidated school right here on this campus, and I could guarantee you that we would save millions of dollars the day that we opened it, but understanding the needs of our community, I don't think that's the priority today. Thank you. Sure. Just, just one, one last question. Did, did I hear you right? And just maybe, so those that voted no, so I'm just trying to get a sense of the no votes and what that meant. You said 157 voted no. 47% of them understood the tax. They, didn't, they weren't confused by the signs. Is that what you indicated? They um, understood what the tax rate was? So of those, of the 157 people who responded to this question saying that I voted but I did not support the budget, 47.1% right. said that I knew the estimated tax rate and I still felt that it was too high. And so I always like to translate numbers back to so how many people is that? Um, so that's 74 people of the 157 that responded said, I knew what it was, I just didn't support it. So, so my question becomes, of all the no votes, I mean, it's a much bigger universe, 157 said no. Is there any reason to believe this is a fairly representative mirror of the others that voted, or is there no way you can draw any type of correlation? I mean, the real key here is to figure out why are people voting no. Yeah. And so I don't think that yet, um, sorry to interrupt you, yeah. I don't think that we can yet start to make a correlation. Okay. The data is not proportionate of our community at this time based on who responded. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping that as folks respond over the, over the rest of this week and the weekend, that it, the data will become more valid. Um, but we're always going to be keeping in mind, so what are the limitations of this data? Because remember, it's also only one source, and we never want to rely on only one source when making definitive decisions. But um, it's just meant to inform and to make us maybe think deeper and ask tough questions of ourselves. Thank you. Thank you. And I think the other important part to that also when we're talking about who did not support, um, so 74 people said I knew and it was still too high, 42 people said I'm against any increase at all. Thank you. Any other questions? I think that um, the only other thing I would, I would say is that I've been thinking a lot about what our next steps are, as have many of you, all of you, um, including I'm sure many people in our community. And I feel that um, as I'm still learning the community, it really is tricky to know what the best next step is. I really feel like we're trying to hit a missing target. Um, and yet I feel that we're all committed to really being responsive to our community. I think that we're really aware of, I th when we started the budget process, Kate and I had many conversations about what are the needs and what is the capacity of our community to support that. And it does feel a little out of balance for me. Um, I do have to say that as, as a newcomer to Scarborough, I view our community as being a really educated community. Uh, every person who I interact with in this community is, is really well educated. Um, and that that might sound a little anecdotal, but it definitely comes from a plural of anecdotes. Um, and when I talked, I was talking with the Commissioner of Education this morning, and I asked, you know, who are the other school districts in Maine whose school budgets failed? And when I look at this list, you know, I don't understand why Scarborough is on this list. Um, there were only five other districts who, um, actually one of them passed, their, their budget actually passed, but it failed in two of the small towns that they're combined with. So that, that makes the list even smaller. So we're really one of four other communities. Um, and so I, I'm trying to understand that, that dynamic. I wonder if we lower the tax rate, is then, then do we get to yes? Um, I'm not quite sure if that's the answer. If we share the responsibility of lowering the tax rate as we, as we have been up to this point, two-thirds, one-third, does that get us to yes? Um, I wonder about the implications of that decision. Does the school um, you know, manage that burden of getting us below 3%? Um, is that the right answer? I don't know if, that, if the right answer to that is yes. When I hear that there's so many, there's such a large portion of our population that just doesn't want a tax increase at all. Um, I'm, I'm more than willing and um, offering to be collaborative and, 
and work with folks and understand and talk with the community about what this budget actually looks like. But I'm just wondering where the tipping point is, and I know that's kind of just a hypothetical question I'm throwing out there, but um, it, it's quite perplexing because I know that this was a good budget and it, it, there was not outlandish increases and I tried to really not focus on what we're not getting from the state because I don't think that's healthy, healthy and I don't think that helps us move forward. And one of the other things that I am committed at what I did not do in this cycle and I don't I don't want to do in the future is try to pull an emotional card um, and get people out to vote because they feel like they're losing some kind of critical program for their kids. To me, that's irresponsible. That's not my job as your superintendent to do that. And so, yes, I've been managing the reductions by projecting tighter and by eliminating um, you know, certain areas of the budget that won't directly impact our students because I think that that's my responsibility as your superintendent. And I guess I'm just uh, asking the community to recognize that, to ask questions and get clarity, and to support the work that we're trying to do because we, our students really are our future. That's not just a cliche. They really are going to take care of all of us when we're old and we need them. So we need to make sure they're really smart and very empathetic and compassionate and good citizens. Thank you very much. With that, to um, then begin the process for us, um, what I would like to do is first, in order to, um, under um, council rules and pro uh, processes, that um, the motion that has been drafted will begin that conversation. Then we will um, go into a conversation around uh, several parts of that um, um, motion. Um, and everyone should feel free and be comforted um, to some extent, or, or not comforted, because should have expectation that we will have a full conversation and a full debate regarding every one of these sections and that we won't finish until everyone is comfortable. Um, so what I would like to do at least uh, for the record, because we do need a motion on the floor, is to, um, I would like to introduce, without reading the entire motion, because there's a lot of whereases and um, uh, be it for the order, I'm going to highlight really outside of the legal language, four sections, um, excuse me, five sections, um, and I have a very quick amendment on the very first one um, that can move us um, into the, the real substantive part. But uh, to read those pieces, um, I do want to mention that the third whereas does indicate in this that um, the referendum question would be scheduled for July 18th. Order number 17-064. Um, is that item that would set that date, and I know there's going to be a discussion about maybe having a different date. Um, so if we could consider um, at some point in this conversation to simply restate that for this purpose, to have it as on a date consistent with any approval in order number 17-064, because we will need to close the item before we would be able to move on to that item. And um, I don't think we need to debate that given the debate that will happen on the other item. So just take that in consideration. There's four items. I'll start with the first one um, under the be it further ordered. Um, the recommendation is that the school budget be reduced by $236,000 um, and that the net sum would be $47,175.168, resulting in the town of Scarborough's raising the sum of $42,254,017 as the local share for educational operating budget. The second, be it further ordered, is that the town budget is hereby amended to reduce the paving, I'm sorry, the paving account by $71,000 for a new operating budget of $32,000, sorry, 32000 I wish, a <laughs> uh, new operating budget of $32,589,519, resulting in the local share of the municipal budget, the sum of $18,167,935. The next, be it further ordered, um, is that the final result of these changes produces a net budget of $62,724,112 with a property tax increase of 2.99%. This will not necessarily <coughs> be discussed only because it is a net result of our actions before that, um, but I wanted to at least have the public understand what these other um, items um, will have an effect on this. And then the last item, which will also be discussed, is that um, to be a further ordered, and this is the last, is that in the event the school department receives more state educational subsidy than the amount included in its budget, that the entirety be allocated to the school department's fund balance to offset the property taxes in the future. 
So those are the four outside of the change in the date to be consistent with any action on 64. Um, the real substantive pieces are those um, three items. So as I mentioned, one of them, again, is just a calculation and the net of the other two. So with that, um, rather than um, entertaining any amendments at this time, what I would like to ask for discussion is um, should the budget be, um, just to get us started, should the budget actually be reduced? Um, and what is council's consent or what is council's opinion on that? Point of order, do you need yes. a motion first? Is that oh, I'm sorry, absolutely. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, actually, that was in the form of a motion as an overview, so I would take a second. A second. second. Okay. Now, uh, for opening up the conversation, um, I would like to ask, you know, what is the, um, the opinion of the council regarding the overall budget and whether it should be reduced? Mr. Chiazzo. I believe the overall budget should be reduced. Mr. Donovan. I agree. I think the uh, budget should be reduced to honor the vote of the electorate. Mr. Hayes? Yeah, I concur. I mean, I think we've heard loud and clear from both the serving <coughs> information and from the vote that we need to reduce the budget. Mr. Um, Rowan. So I'd like to say, given the information that I have today, um, I agree that the budget should be reduced. Um, I lament the fact that I don't have complete information um, and that in the future I reserve the right to change my mind um, should we hear more clarity from Augusta. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Foley, is here? I agree we have to reduce the budget. So if we want to speak up uh, as well, I just want to make sure everybody can hear plus the public. I've been told I, my voice doesn't carry even though I think I have a big mouth. So. Council St. Clair, anything that you'd like to say? No, I agree. We need to lower the budget. Um, I, for myself, um, I agree to the extent that I completely agree with Councilor Rowan. Um, we have incomplete information, particularly where the state of Maine is. Um, and the reason is that I do believe that we have a uh, very good budget before us. Understanding where they come in makes a material difference in the pathway that we can take. But given the information, I completely support the conversation that we're going to have tonight. So um, with that, really, the next question is, um, how much? That's going to start the entire debate. Councilor Hayes? I guess I'd make a suggestion based on some of the things that I've heard and based on our goals as a, a council is to reduce the budget so we come in with an overall effective tax rate of at or about 3%. Um, numerically, I believe um, that is $307,000. Is that correct, Mr. Yes. Manager? So just for the public, three, to reduce that to tax, uh, it's $307,000 that we're looking to distribute. Any other recommendations? And again, this is for conversation, not as an amendment, but yes. Yeah. Uh, so I, I would, <laughs> if we had knew that number to begin with, we wouldn't maybe be in this mess. Um, I think at minimum we have to hit our goal of 3%. I think oh, for me uh, what that right number is really depends on less what the percentage number is and where we get, the, where we get it from because how we get to our budget number for me as I've, I've talked about in the past really matters. Um, so if we are going to open up the municipal side of the budget and we're going to continue with the one town one budget approach and share that uh, burden, um, then that number for me might be different from what it might be if we just are asking our schools to take on the full cut. So I think I need to hear a little bit more of the full conversation before I could give you uh, an exact number, what I think, but I, I, I would say at a minimum we need to hit 3% at a minimum. Councilor Rowan? I would say that I, I don't necessarily agree that we need to hit 3% at a minimum, but I, I will agree with Councillor Foley that I think that how we get there um, makes, makes a difference in, in what we do and in, in the ultimate number that we do. Councillor Piazza? So um, we are sitting here guessing. We, we have no point of reference as to what we think is acceptable. We've heard from multiple different people in multiple different camps of what individually they may like, uh, and it ranges from negative to zero to everything in between. I, I think um, the only thing that, that allows me to support the 3% tax rate is that that was our original goal and that's at least a tangible number and a defendable position that we can take. It's logical. Uh, I don't like that amount. I think it's, 
it's it's a bit heavy-handed for my liking. However, um, you know, uh, elections have consequences. So I think 3% is a def an easily understood and easily defendable number to come back with. I just want to add one more thing that what, wherever we land, I want it to pass. So that, uh, that, that's most important to me. I don't want to go through this three times like we did in 2015. And um, so being really thoughtful uh, is going to be important. Communicating is going to be really important. Um, and I think we heard from the voters pretty clearly a significant uh, cut is needed. So I, th I mean, we all, we, we unanimously passed a budget. We believed 3.4% was reasonable. Um, so I, I, I'm just concerned that even 3% might not pass, <laughs> but I hope it will. I'd just like to uh, state that what happened two years ago, again, was we, we had a uh, referendum fail, um, and then we had a large cut from the school budget, um, and nobody liked it. The folks that thought that taxes were uh, too high, you know, didn't vote for it. Um, and we lost the supporters of the schools that, that were saying that that tax was too draconian. Um, and I think that um, we run the risk of doing that again. Um, and so the, we're really uh, walking a tight line here. And then we need to keep that in mind. Councillor uh, St. Clair? Um, I have to say that I don't totally agree with Councillor Rowan. Um, in 2015, part of the problem was that in the first vote, people didn't show up to vote. And that was the frustrating part. And so then we had to take this, we took a, we took a drastic cut. That was a bad, a bad play. We, we did, we went deep. And it angered people and it made them go out and vote, which is what they should have done two weeks ago or last week. And the people that did go out and vote last week, we have to honor what they said. And unfortunately, we don't have a number, but we have to listen to that. They are the majority. They won the vote. Whether we like it or not, that's the si that's the situation that we're in. Um, so, three percent. I hope three percent will pass. I would hate to see if we had to go any deeper than that. But I am frustrated that we don't have numbers from Augusta because um, it feels like we're sort of playing with fire here. I mean, we could make these cuts, and then we find out that somebody up in Augusta finally decides to get their act together, and we get this money back. So it's frustrating. Yeah. So again, it, you know, it strikes me that I, I hope everybody, everybody's ultimate goal, both the council and the community, is to get a budget that can pass. I think that was always been our goal. I think that was our first goal as well, and I thought we did a reasonable job of doing that. Um, most people didn't agree with that, um, but I think we are in a dangerous position of trying to predict what people want. We've heard things. We've heard it's too much. We've heard and we have you know, experienced that if we do cut too deep, the pendulum could swing the other way. So we are really setting, an, in essence, an arbitrary number in the hope and faith that this budget will pass. And so from my perspective, um, if it's at least something that has a bit of rationale and a bit of, of understanding behind it of why we've come to that number, and it's not just a we hope it's the right one, uh, I think that's a little bit easier to defend, especially when we all agreed that the budget as it went out was a reasonable budget. And people in the community agreed that. And even people who opposed the budget agreed it was a reasonable amount and said as much in public. So I just want to caution us of, remember this is first reading as well. So if we start in at 3.5%, excuse me, at a 3% tax rate, we still have several weeks to gather some more info, we can make final motions at the end. This isn't making the ultimate decision. But I think we ought to start with the 3% because that's a number that's in line with what our original goals were. And it's very easy for us to come and say, this is the number that we initially wanted, and this is why we're choosing this number. Councilor Hayes. Yeah, just a couple, couple context questions to, to Councilor Rowland's questions. And I, I, think I, I think that was the first year I was on the council when we had that, that piece. And if I remember right, the cut we made was about $500,000. I mean, it was a big number. We came back, and I think we ended up with a number similar to this. I mean, it was in the 250-ish range. So, sure. you know, so at least that's you know, kind of a check that, yes, we, we, the pendulum swang way back. And then two, 
I think it, I think we do. I think those times are much different than these times. I mean, clearly, I think if you just look at the numbers and if you look at the microcosm of the world and what's happening out there, um, we have done and we haven't shared a lot, but you know, the communication, you know, committee has been doing some just listening sessions to people, and we have really heard a lot about people's frustrations and concerns and affordability and other things. So I think there is some relatively good data to suggest um, that taxes are becoming an issue for a lot of folks in Scarborough. Certainly we've put some property relief, tax relief things in place. So I think, I think, it's, I think we need to look at that as a learning. But I think this is also a, a different microcosm. And some of the serving information, um, I, I think, suggests that, that you know, I, I think our goal has been 3%. We've hit 3% consistently. I think that's, I agree with Council Kidd, that's a good place to start. I really hope from the public hearing we'll hear, we'll, we'll be able to hear a lot from both sides and, you know, lots of different opinions which will allow us to adjust. But I think it's kind of a reasonable place maybe to start the conversation in. Council Foley. Um, so I just have two kind of points to make. Uh, the first is I've heard a lot about uh, the signs and that it caused people to vote and react out of fear. Um, conversely, I, I want us to be careful of the same thing. I don't want to act out of fear that we're going to have, you know, I think both sides, if you will, and I'm just kind of calling sides because right now that's what we have. I think both sides could go spend more money, launch bigger campaigns, and bring out even more people to vote and we could still end up in, in the same boat. That's not what I want for our community. Um, so I don't want to react out of fear that all of a sudden the schools group is going to come at us and say no too low again. I think, and the reason why I have hope, um, <laughs> I really do, uh, we have an advantage over what we had two years ago and that's we have a different kind of a school leader. She just demonstrated that very clearly in her comments mm -hmm. to us tonight, in every action she has taken thus far. Um, I've worked with a lot of superintendents in my lifetime, and I put her up in the top three of, of all that I've worked with, and I mean that sincerely. I think if we had given her the right number from the get-go, I think we would have passed the budget on the first vote. That's my truly my deep belief. I think we pushed it a little bit at 3.4%. So um, I could be wrong. And if I'm wrong, then that's what I'll, you know, the voters will tell us that. Because, like I've said before, you know, we all have our own personal values um, that we believe in. Um, but ultimately, we don't decide it. The school board doesn't even ultimately decide it. The community decides it. And we do have to listen. Um, so that's, I'll leave it at that for now. Councilor Donovan. I think 3% is uh, uh, an important figure that we've put out there for several years now as a goal to keep our budgets low, predictable, uh, which we're calculating, putting a number to it, 3% or thereabouts or below. Uh, uh, we had some special circumstances this year that made it difficult to get to uh, 3%, but 3.4% uh, was uh, a very good effort on the part of the schools in the town. Uh, we can't make, the vote is the vote, and therefore to respect the vote, you can't make an insubstantial change, uh, and I think the 307,000 that has been put out there, which would bring us to just below 3%, is not insubstantial. It is a significant amount uh, it would be a hardship, in my opinion, for it to be borne solely by the school because I don't think the school's the real problem here. I think there's all sorts of problems that we've experienced uh, and uh, we've enumerated them before. Our school per pupil costs are right in the middle of all the schools that we would want to be compared to. We're not high. Uh, and for a year in and year out, we've had budgets in recent years, this is the fourth one that I've been involved with, averaging 2.4, 2.5, 2.6. So we've, we've been uh, fair to the commitment we made to try and have 3% or less. I'd be okay, I think it's a, it's a reach, 307, but I think it's necessary in light of the vote. 
So uh, keep in mind, we do not have a motion yet or any amend I should say any amendments. Um, there's <coughs> my response is that I think that um, the conversation in every aspect matter whether we talk about the dollar amount, where it comes from, um, even to the extent of where the state comes in or even where we then um, um, allocate any ex excess, uh, I should say excess, not really excess, any increase in, in funding from the state is somewhat uh, uh, dichotomous in the sense that um, I have a pendulum that swings and that is that I think 3% is a compromise but I have points in the conversation in which I ask myself why aren't we supporting the budget as it is until we have more information from the state because that significantly changes the dynamic of this conversation. And even though the state has been irresponsible in not setting their budget yet, um, you know, we are subject to that. And, and the reason why I come to that position, um, it, both as far as supporting the 3%, but also supporting the budget as it is, is that we went through a very collaborative joint process. And, um, you know, we, caught, we, we set a goal of 3% as a council. We told the school board as part of that joint process in our joint committee that that was our goal. And I personally made the compromise and said I wasn't going to meet that goal of 3% in order to support the school system based upon the conditions that we're dealing with. So I'm willing to continue to support that with more information. And that is purely by, um, uh, by the state's allocation. I don't think it's going to be a million dollars. I don't know if it's going to be $3 million, but I don't know if it's going to be 500000 that can all be used in the current year. It does change the dynamic. Um, because I then have to jump to the question about the allocation, which is the last item, because below a certain dollar value, I don't find there's value to split that between, you know, uh, putting into the reserve fund and then putting it into um, tax base. It should all go to the current year. It's what we're getting from the state. It's supposed to be for education. I understand if it's going to be, if it's $3 million, that's a different investment decision. Um, so I have this swing, and I'll be honest with you, um, I'm also emotionalized by this because of the pathway that we are here today. I think it's absolutely deplorable what happened with the no vote and the robocalls and the, and the, mis, and the misperceptions. So I go through that emotional stage. Um, I can support the 3%. I can also support the argument of not moving it forward, I'm uh, sorry, moving it forward with no adjustment until we have the more information. But I think we need to find the compromise in our decisions, and I'm willing, at least for the first reading, to take that into consideration and look at that 3%. Again, um, I personally believe that the allocation between the school and the town is a different question, and we will be taking that up next because that is the third part of this. So the question I have is that is there, com um, is there comfort to ask for an amendment that we um, have the adjustment of 307000 and then we can talk about where that is? W would we have the option to amend later? Because I think, again, Absolutely. how we get there is very important. Absolutely. Sorry, yes. point, point of clarity. Uh, the original motion is for 307, is that correct? So we do, do we need a second motion to confirm that? I might, I might suggest that you, you do uh, work through the next question uh, before you take formal amendments. That way you can okay. actually uh, attribute particular dollar amounts um, if you choose to share the responsibility. That's exactly how the... And, and I think that prepared. supports Council Chiasso's point because then we can determine Way to go from that. So I'm trying to keep score, and if I could, I, it, it, very clearly the first question, should the budget be reduced, uh, I heard everyone say yes very clearly, and it seems as though the secondary question, if so, by how much? There seem to be uh, at least five fairly strong supporters for 3%, which is 307, and two that kind of acquiesced and understood that, that uh, for first reading purposes that might be where we need to be. Is that fair? Okay. I just want to make sure we're all on the same page as we step to the next. So the next part of this is really to have the conversation, if it is to be reduced by the $307,000, should it be shared by the school and the town as it is currently proposed in the first, be it further ordered, um, uh, the first and the second? Should this be shared? Uh, we'll, we can talk about the portion of it after, but should it be shared? Ms. Kazan? Yes, I agree. It should be shared. Mr. Rowan? I think if we're talking about adjusting the tax rate, then yes, I absolutely think it needs to be shared. Donovan? Yeah, I, uh, I feel it should be shared because this has been a, a one-town, one-budget collaborative process. We have tried to create a relationship with the school board and the finance committee of the school board uh, where we're working together to achieve. We only have one tax bill. 
we only have one tax rate. Uh, so when people get their bill, it's got the municipal uh, budget in it, it's got the school budget in it. So we need to be able to work together effectively. Uh, and we were able to achieve that. We had a unanimous vote out of the finance committee, both finance committees to support this budget. We had a unanimous vote out of the town council to support this budget. So uh, I really feel as if, given the fact that the school's budget as submitted was endorsed by us, was the lowest year over year spending increase in the last five years, that their per pupil cost is at best in the average range. So are we sp is the school spending too much? They've lost millions of dollars. If that had happened to our code enforcement office, all of a sudden Augusta decides to take all of the fees. Uh, and they were running uh, this 7.4% on their budget. Would we stop doing inspections? Of course not. It's when you try to allocate revenue to a particular department, it can get skewed. Uh, and that's really what's happened here. When you keep r taking money away from the school department, it makes it much more difficult for them to uh, uh, have their own budget look like it's at an appropriate <coughs> level. This is the 7.4% argument. Uh, but in point of fact, they were only up 3.4 percent in their in their sp spending, uh, and that that was an outstanding effort, given that 70 percent of what they have are employees, and the health care costs are largely out of their control, uh, uh, and we need to hire people uh, who are uh, in competition with everybody else who wants to hire the best people, and that's all in the two to three percent annual cost increase. So. Getting to low threes is very easy. So should we share? Yeah, I think we should. I think it's absolutely uh, uh, appropriate that the town uh, pitch in just the way they have in years past. Um, so keep, if, if I can just have, have a procedural. So keep in mind that we still have an opportunity to debate the merits of the, of, uh, the direction that we're going, because so, we're going to have to have amendments. So um, if we can... Um, maybe uh, synthesize the conversation to, so that way we can determine what is going to be the amendment and then we can have the debate about the value of that. I think it will help because I want everyone to have a comment or a sec time in that. Um, Councilor Foley? So this is where it gets sticky for me because um, I do believe in the one town, one budget concept. Uh, and I'm going to read this because I'm going to otherwise I'll, I won't have the courage to say what I really feel and I think that's important. Um, my experience and observation, though, has been that it's, it is a very cooperative process, um, but it's not one that I would call truly collaborative or inclusive, and I think that's an area that we can improve on. Uh, I do realize that's a very nuanced difference, and, and if you're not behind the scenes and involved, you may not understand what I'm saying, um, uh, but I do think it's significant to the discussion, because even as an elected official here, I felt like I had no voice uh, with the Board of Education, and I had no voice with my, the council, and uh, even the smallest attempt I made to uh, make any kinds of changes were met um, with what I felt was uh, host hostility and aggression. And I think those are things that we can do better. Um, so right now I walk into this with uh, a little <coughs> bit of a lack of trust, and that's just me being honest. I would like to share the responsibility um, but my fear is I don't, I, I certainly don't support it coming $70,000 straight from the paving budget. I was called irresponsible just to suggest we take 6000 of that paving budget. So from that perspective, I don't, and I understand you wanted short, quick answers, but I don't feel like that's fair either. Um, this, is a con this is a, con I do understand. Um, so for me, The idea of whether we share that responsibility or not, um, it depends on where it's coming from and how we get there. I'd be happy if the school didn't have to take on the full 307,000. Maybe they only do the 230. That's their suggested portion, and so that puts us a little above the 3%. But uh, at this point, I have a hard time supporting sharing it. 
Yeah, and I guess I'm, I really struggle with this too. And I think um, I think this is the category of, and I think you've heard it from different counselors. I think it really does matter where the money is going to come from. And, and so there's a, there's a couple things for me. We have heard loud and clear about how we operate. Do we create trust? Um, Chair Chairman Bayby, I know you mentioned, and I know, and I will go back to the public meetings we've had in Joint Finance Committee, and Councillor Chiesa was very clear saying in our conversations that if this budget didn't pass, that the school was going to have to make up whatever it was that, that we then came back with. So it was, it was clear, it was communicated, it was communicated publicly where we have now changed our direction. Um, for the first read, I, I, I think it should be um, all from the school. I'm really curious to hear what we hear in public feedback um, at the public hearings and others to see if that's the right place to be or not. Um, I know we've talked a lot, and I think this, this kind of echoes some of what we heard before. We've talked about one town, one budget. I believe in that. I think what the polls are telling us and what voters are telling us, even though we believe in that, we haven't convinced them yet that that's the way they want to operate. So I think we're at the risk or really need to listen to voters. I think voters still see there are two distinct budgets. That's a communication issue and some things that we need to do to really try to get their buy-in. I think, I think we do, as we sit here and try to do this, we've said we don't want to go to a third vote. Um, so I think we do need to do some calculus about those that voted no. We've got to give them a reason to vote yes. If we make changes to what they've already constructed, I think there is a risk that we'll get more no votes, and that's not an outcome. So in the first read, I'll reserve the right, much like Council Rome, that as we get more information. The third thing I'd like to say, I do know from the Finance Committee we are at the town level are at essential services and actually our last round of cuts we actually cut services <coughs> and increased fees at two of our beach communities and we heard a lot about that that really created some issues so i know from the town side whatever we do on the town side is cutting into essential services i would like to understand more about the impact of what this number does to the school's delivery of essential services so i'd like to kind of come back to this conversation for the second read when we have a much better idea of how do we minimize the impact to our community and still reach this overall goal that we just established. So I'd, I'd say no for now. So I was going to save this for the debate, but since it was brought up, um, you, you, you know, there's, um, there's a reason that um, I think we, we've come down the way that we've come down. And Councillor Hayes, you yourself have said, uh, this town is going to have to make some tough choices moving forward. We were hoping that would come next year, but I think the result of this vote uh, clearly indicates that that time is now. And the tough decisions have to come if we truly believe in the one town, one budget, and we all were genuine when we sat behind this desk and we get up in public and said, this is the process we support. Then those tough decisions, however unpopular they may be, need to happen. And we have to have the intestinal fortitude, I think, and the strength of character and will to be able to make those decisions and do them in a way that's fair and equitable as best as to our ability that we can with the moving information that we have. So, um, yes, my position has changed. It's changed for a couple of reasons, which I will elaborate further on in, in, in uh, counselor comments because I don't think they're appropriate for this particular aspect of it. But I do think it is very critical in fact, I think it's essential that we maintain the one town, one budget approach because this is the true test right now, right here, because it's been all words up until this point. This is really where the town, we either move forward or we go right back to where we were before. The town might not be ready for that, but as town leaders, I certainly hope we are ready to move that pendulum forward. So Councilor Sinclair and I are the only two that are not... Um answer the question regarding do we believe that it should be shared or if it uh, should not be. Councilor, do you have any comments? Um, yeah, I guess. I mean, um, I hate this part of the year. Um, I, I don't think, I, I think that we asked the superintendent at the beginning of the budget season and we asked the town manager at the beginning of the budget season to provide us with a budget that came in at or around 3%. And the town did that. 
I still believe in the one town, one budget, and I don't think by saying no that I don't think we should share in that responsibility at this time without further numbers makes me not a team player or that I'm not showing up for the game or that I'm not supporting the schools. That's f the furthest thing from the truth. The point is that I, I, I'm very uncomfortable asking Tom's people to go back to the drawing board again. Um, I'm not, I'm not happy asking the schools to do it. I wish we didn't have to. Um, but at this point, we don't have all the numbers. It seems ir irresponsible to, 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 to give full answers, but I, I don't think we have the room in the town. I, I, I just don't think it's fair to ask them. Um, and if, you, if I had to give um, a point blank answer tonight, I would say no. I don't want it to come from the municipality side. Um, for the purpose of, uh, and I'm going to be very uh, simple because I want to save it for the actual uh, kind of debate where it should be. Uh, for the purposes of discussion, I'm, I'm okay in moving this forward where it is uh, split between both. I, I want to be clear though, and I will answer questions, uh, not answer questions, I will make comments regarding the conversations that have happened because I've made some of those statements and I want to make sure that people understand uh, what they were in the context, but for the purposes of the debate, I, I do believe that we should move forward with a opening that, um, even though principally I may not agree with it, which I hope is an indication that the way that the motion was drafted is not personal, because I don't know if I agree with this. So uh, for the purposes of debate, I believe by count is that there are four in favor and three against, so we will move forward by having it split between the two. What I would like to do um, is um, we do need to answer the next question, which is what proportional uh, share should that be split? Are we in agreement with the, with the main motion um, that says that in essence two thirds, um, there is a two thirds, one third split? Um, Councilor Chiazza? I am in agreement with the main motion. Thank you. Councilor Rowan? I'm not sure the main motion does have a two third, one third split. I'd also like to point out that the, the gross operating budget has the, t has the uh, education budget less than 60%, um, which is less than a two third, one third. Okay, so I'll, I'll restate this. Um, are we in agreement that the $236,000 should come from the school budget and the $71,000 should come from the town budget? Council Rook, uh, sorry, Council Chiazza. I am in agreement with that. Okay. Council Donovan? Uh, I'm in agreement with it with the caveat that, uh, and this is in deference to those who have real concerns about the town budget, that the matter really needs to be evaluated by the, the town finance committee. Uh, and so uh, if at a point we arrive at uh, voting on the main motion as it's presently structured, I would move to uh, replace the paving bu budget reference with uh, uh, a recommendation from the finance committee so that at second reading, we'd all have the opportunity to see whether, what our comfort level is with the cuts that would be made at the town level presently recited at $71,000. And that number could change uh, depending on what the Finance Committee recommends. And for the public, just to reference Councilor Donovan, if I understand correctly, he had submitted a draft of what he would recommend, and that is in the second be it further ordered. He is suggesting um, adding language that will come forward later as an amendment, uh, possibly. Details of the specific reductions are to be identified as special workshop of the town council and incorporated by amendment at the final reading. So um, that will come forward um, after um, we've made this decision and any amendments, but uh, just wanted that to be on the record. Councilor Foley? You were doing a poll, right? I, so I agree with the split. Uh, if, if that's where the direction we're going and we're opening the municipal budget, then I, I, I think the allocation is the right amount. I don't agree with the paving, but we're, I think that's off the table. Coming next. That's not the question. Yeah. Coming next. Coming um, next. But it's coming, though. Yeah. I know. Yeah. Any other? Uh, Councilor Rowan, Sinclair, Councilor Hayes, myself, we haven't timed in really. Any comments? Um, uh, no. <laughs> and I, I guess I'm, I'm a little Anybody? confused. So, I mean, the question on the table is a, a $71,000 number? Correct. Well, both. 
the, two, the split between 236, 71, whatever that ratio split is, or is there, uh, by the way, uh, you can answer the question, is there another method that you would like to use? Um, I guess at this point, I believe, I guess where I would be, I'm conceptually splitting it. I don't know how, I'm not sure there'd be support. I am really uncomfortable making any commitment to any numbers to better understand where these things are, and I think it's going to be really important that we identify where the potential changes are going to be by the time we have the public hearing so that everybody in this community has a chance to express their views about the changes that we're, we're making. So, you know, I guess I'm on board with there's a split. I'm just not, I, I'm not embracing any number until we have the next step, which, which is we're flying blind. I don't know what, sure. where we're going to land. Um, and I'll come back and talk. We are going to talk about whether where the recommendation comes from on the town at a later date, or is that part of this conversation? Um, it will be part of the conversation because I believe there's an amendment coming to address that. Yeah, and I guess I would be in the place. I I would recommend it does not go to the finance committee. Oh, um, because what we heard last time, and because this is a short time period, and because we're talking about such important issues, the last time it came through the finance committee, some of the other council members that didn't participate in that and didn't have a seat at the table really didn't have the same ability to participate in dialogue about pros and cons of each one. I would recommend staff develops recommendations and we as a full council agree at some type of workshop or whatever it is on what we're going to bring forth as what we agree on are, are the changes. Sorry. So um, just to clarify, as I read, um, that um, is consistent with what Council Donovan has presented as a possible amendment. So um, his recommendation is consistent. I just read that before you made that statement, sir. But I thought he said the Finance Committee just... No, I just read it and said, I'll read it again. Details of the specific reductions are to be identified in a special workshop of the Town Council and incorporated by amendment at the final reading. Um, that's fine with that. That's great. Yes. So. Thank you for that clarification. I'm great. Thank you. Um, just a point to, to remind you, uh, it remains to be seen whether the Council, should that prevail, and it sounds like it may well, it remains to be seen if the council is able to meet and make those decisions before the 28th, next Wednesday. I think you need to. Um, so failing that, I'm just saying uh, to ensure you get good public input, it may be important to at least fix the dollar amount, though you may not be able to identify where it's coming from, but at least you have, you're informing the public of some intention. Um, oftentimes we hear from the public that to change things in second reading and don't listen mm -hmm. to us. So at least you put it out there and you'll get comment, good or bad. I'm okay with that. Great. So um, as far as I'm concerned, um, I'm willing to at least, uh, again, it, it's consistent with, uh, for purposes of discussion, I think this is where we need to start off. Uh, and then once we have amendments, that's where we're on. Uh, so my preference would be to see it in proportion to the gross budget, which is less than which would be a uh, less burden on the school, slightly higher burden on the town. Than what's stated? Than what's currently in the first okay. grade. To, Sean, sorry, yeah. point, point of clarification, if yeah. I could, to the manager. Um, these numbers were discussed with staff, correct? They are, these are not just arbitrary splits, so this was a, a, an informed yeah. discussion, if you will, between staff, correct? It was between myself and the superintendent. Yeah. Yes. Okay, thank you. A, and really, I wanted to make sure, at least to invite the conversation, had a had a number there for you to react to. Uh, mm -hmm. There is some rationale behind that number. Probably not necessary to share all that tonight, but certainly when you reconvene, if you do, I yeah, will. Yeah, my only point was that, to Councillor Rowan's point, is it wasn't the actual two-third, one-third mathematical right. split. They're, they're, those numbers were part of a discussion, <coughs> a, a, a general discussion, if you will. Yes, good point. It was never intended to meet that proportional split. And I, underst I understood it came from the uh, uh, discussions between the town manager and the superintendent and that there was a consensus uh, and that therefore I felt comfortable supporting it. I think I'm going to okay. st stay where I was. I'm going to stand but I appreciate the <laughs> <No. laughs> um, I would expect Kate, nothing less. You're the only one that really, did, are you comfortable with moving forward? Did you have something to add? Well, no, I mean, I'm not happy at all. I don't, I don't know where, the, where these guys are going to come up with 230,000, and I don't know where we're going to come up with 70,000. And I'll be honest, I mean, it's, it's frustrating because I sat here two or three weeks ago asking for, to take 5,000 out of the paving budget and felt like I just hit someone's child. 
So, I mean, it's really frustrating. And I understand Tom put that in the budget that was not made by a counselor, so let's make that very clear. But it's hard to sit here and see this, oh, this grand support for something. And I walked out of here a couple of weeks ago thinking, I don't even want to walk back in there, in that council chamber. And that's just the way that I feel. Um, I didn't feel like there was good communication between us. I felt like um, that if you weren't on one side, then you were a terrible person. And if you weren't on the other side, you were a terrible person. And in reality, the sad part is we all want the same thing. And somehow we're missing the boat here, big time. And it's the, 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 bigger, the bigger problem is that we're doing it in front of the public, and the public is noticing it, and we're getting feedback on it. I realize that's a whole other issue, but it boils down to how I feel about casting a vote tonight. And I don't know how to cast a vote on something that I don't even have firm numbers on. And I know that there's a, there is two numbers that are in the motion. I get that. And I know that those are, the, those are the target numbers that everyone thinks we need to hit. But we don't have numbers from the state. Um, we obviously aren't going to have numbers from the evaluation for a while, which is acceptable, but it's, it's frustrating. And we heard from people that took the time to go out and vote, and if you didn't go out and vote, then that's your, that you made that choice. But we heard from people that went out and vote, and we got 70 some odd emails in the last two days from people, and numerous emails said, we don't have a problem with the town budget. We have a major problem with the school budget. It's hard to read and see and then sit here and, and not say anything and not, not acknowledge that and not do anything about it. Just, it's hard to swallow. So at this point, for consensus-wise, I'll move it forward so that we can continue the discussion, but I, I think we have some serious problems. Sure. So uh, with that, um, I think what I would like to suggest, um, if it's the will of the council, is to begin entertaining any amendments that we would like, um, starting at the beginning. What I would like to propose is in the third whereas, it's minor, but in the third whereas, um, at the end, to strike um, for July 18, 2017, and insert um, a date consistent with any approval of order number 17-064. So just to read that for the public so that they understand what that is, is that it reads, the, council, the town council must resubmit an adjusted school budget to the voters for validation no less than 10 days and no more than 45 days from June 13, 2017, with the next school budget validation referendum scheduled for a date consistent with any approval or order, um, sorry, any approval of order number 17-064, which will be taken up could in a few, well, um, in a little bit. Can I, can I get a point of order before we take amendments? Um, we didn't talk about the last um, kind of item that's open for debate, which was what we do with future future monies. I don't know if we wanted to get a straw poll before we... Oh, no, there's, there's two issues. There's where does the money come from? We haven't talked about that either, I don't think. Have we? No, I don't think so. Mm -mm. So I'm trying to segment them so that we can then um, stage ourselves into that. Okay. So, um, and the reason is because um, if we haven't made a decision about what the allocation is, at least for the first reading, then you really can't have a conversation about the allocation where it's coming from. And Councilor Donovan did suggest that that issue around the paving account is actually, he's going to recommend that it be stricken um, and changed um, so that there's a workshop of the council. Okay. So in my head, I'm kind of trying to line this up based on the comments that have been suggested already right. so that we can have some approvals. I was hearing that there was consensus begrudgingly around the order of magnitude, the 71,000, but no comfort around identifying where that's to be determined. Right. Or, or, or I, would, I would just clarify, I, I definitely don't want it coming out of paving, so more specifically anything but paving. So the, the amendment that will likely be offered removes any reference removes to paving. paving. Okay. Oh, that's just another point of clarification. So if, I, if I'm reading that correctly, we're not necessarily going to be making any decisions mm -hmm. on specific pieces for the 71,000 tonight. We're going to move that forward to, the, to a council workshop. And that I'm comfortable with. Unless there are other amendments that are going to speak to specific numbers, then I'm that's not comfortable. So long as Councilor Donovan's amendment is uh, seconded and approved, you're okay. absolutely correct. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, it, it may make sense before you get into for, take receiving formal amendments to have um, one final conversation around what to do in the event of additional GPA. It is postured a certain way in this order. Uh, 
there may be differing opinions. Uh, uh, I just offer that up. It may make sense to, you've had such good success kind of talking through and working through uh, before formal amendments are offered. Well, you have it before or after. I think it, the conversation is exactly the same. Um, we, we have, just so you know, we do have a 10 o'clock cutoff for any, new, uh, for any new business, and we do have other business, so I at least want to get through some substantive uh, uh, amendments, but I'm, w I'm willing to take up that conversation now. I just think it's... I think it might change how I, I might respond to some of the other amendments. Okay, absolutely. So the last item um, is, um, be it further... Um, so the last item um, is the conversation on what should we do with a general purpose aid for education, should additional monies be made available through the state budget? Uh, and currently, and uh, currently, um, in the original order that was approved at second reading before, um, that is being split um, between 50% of the school fund balance reserve and 50% that will be applied to uh, tax relief or a uh, reduction in the tax uh, tax obligation. So that's what's yes, Mr. Dunn. If we're getting the uh, uh, tax rate down to 3%, then I think whatever mo monies come, uh, uh, as uncertain as that seems uh, at the moment, uh, should go to fund balance. Council Rowan? Yeah, I would agree if we're, if we're taking heroic measures to, to add certainty to the tax rate this year. Yeah. Any, anything that comes in the future. Should. Yeah, yeah, I would concur with that. Um, I, I, I want it to be clear that uh, just because we don't utilize it this year when it goes to fund balance, it's still available the following budget cycle for utilization. It's just not used right now. So it's not like we're foregoing that revenue. We're just postponing or prolonging when it's going to be used. So I would absolutely support putting 100% to fund balance, as long as we set the tax rate to the assumed rate of 3%. And just, that's the school department's fund balance, just to make sure. Correct. Councilor Foley? So one of the things I've heard in my conversations was um, the fact that we went and did the 50-50 split. People were really like, that was a good move. I appreciate that. I would like to see us stick to our word and stick with the 50-50 split. Councilor Hayes. Yeah, I guess, you know, I, again, I, part of the calculus I'm doing is we need to get those that voted no to vote yes. And one thing that I do know that they have expressed is the reserve issue is, is an issue for them. Again, we as a joint finance committee agreed that that was a worthwhile effort to try to so my concern, I, I, I do not support changing it on the first read. I'd like to get some input. So my vote would be to leave it as we decide as a joint finance committee and revisit it in the second read. But my, my answer would be no for now. Yeah, so I guess, I mean, I, I don't know how we could get everybody that voted no to vote yes. I don't think it's a possibility. That. But I, I, but I do think that um, with the uncertainty in Augusta, there's no real end in sight of the budget crisis up there. I, I think it, for us to wait for them to get their act together, I don't know if that would be prudent. I certainly don't think we'd meet our understood timeline because they are no closer to a budget, I think, today than they were mm. a month ago. So uh, I, I think by one of my reasons for trying to allow that fund balance to go fully to, uh, that any extra to go fully to fund balance is that that allows us to act in a timely manner. We know what that set definitive impact is going to be on the tax rate. If we wait and wait and wait, we're going to miss our, I think, we're going to miss our voting deadline because we're waiting for Augusta to act. That's no guarantee they're going to act. So I think that adds a little bit of definitive uh, uh, impact and an, and an understood and controlled impact on the tax rate now so that we can vote now. And any additional revenues can still be used next year. So I, I think it would just be prudent on us not to rely on Augusta. We've I think clearly shown that relying on them in the past hasn't really benefited us all that much. So I, I would propose that we put it all to fund balance. Any other I would just respond that, um, um, that the budget didn't pass and that, you know, the aspects that people may have liked, we, we can't necessarily judge that. I, I feel like it took me for, for suggesting a different number than what we were talking about and it was suggested that I wasn't listening to the voters. I feel like the same could be said if, if we're not willing to, to make this change. Um, again, uh, unless there's, uh, if there is an amendment, then I'll add more comment. But uh, for the purposes of moving this forward for the first reading, I'm in favor of uh, what has been proposed in the main motion. 
So with that, what I would like to do is go back to my, um, so there was a point of clarification and then we changed it so I took it off, but mm -hmm. um, again, um, and I'm not going to read it again, but I would propose the first amendment is to change the third whereas where the date is eliminated and that we just simply insert a date that's consistent with any approval of order number 17-064. Is there a second? Second. Conversation or comments regarding that change? Not seeing any, all in favor? And it's unanimous, thank you. The next item is the uh, first, be it further ordered. Um, in this order, it um, states that the school budget will be re reduced by $236,000. The question um, on the floor, is there any amendments to this um, section of the action item? Not seeing any, I'm going to move. Uh, I'm sorry, be, the first be it forward? Yes. The school budget will be reduced by a total of $236,000. I can come back to you, Council? No, no I'm all set. I'm all set. Okay. Keep in mind, it is the first reading. Any other, any other, just, or any amendment? Not seeing any. On the next item, under um, be it further ordered, is that the town will reduce the town's budget, sorry, the town budget is hereby amended to reduce the, the paving account by $71,000. So is there an amendment to change either the description uh, or the identification of the paving account or the amount or both in one amendment? Councilor Denovan. Uh, if you could pass down the uh, written amendment that there should have been one at your place. Okay. I, there wasn't. Hmm. Oh, there was. I've got a... Thank you. <coughs> the amendment reads, uh, be it further ordered that the town budget is hereby amended to be reduced by $71,000. Details of the specific reductions are to be identified at a special workshop of the town council and incorporated by amendment at the final reading for a new operating budget of $32,589,519 resulting in the local share for the municipal budget, the sum of 18167935 Is there a second? Second. second. Any comments or questions on the amendment? Yeah. Council Chiazzo. Um, just for scheduling purposes, do we want to decide when we're going to decide that date? I'm not suggesting we do it right here and now, but... Uh, do we need to report back because we have to have public notice and everything else to go with that, right? Correct. And I think we can take that up under uh, standing and special committee reports under the chairman's okay. comments or the chairman's, and then we can okay. try to get a consensus. Any other questions or comments on the amendment as proposed by Councilor Donovan? Not seeing any, all in favor? And that is unanimous. Thank you. Moving into the next item. So um, the, the via further ordered, I believe, will stand as it's currently calculated, so there's no need for a change. The last item is be it further ordered in the event that the Scarborough School Department receives the state subsidy, the amount will be uh, distributed completely to the school department's fund balance. Is there any request for, or is there any amendment to that item? Not seeing any. We are now back to the main motion as amended, um, including all of those items. Is there any uh, need for any clarification based upon where we are? Councilor Foley? <laughs> Probably, but I'm, it's okay. I'm good. Okay. <laughs> Anybody else? So there's no clarification. Any comments that haven't been mentioned? I want to make a couple of comments. So first, um, I respect everyone. I mean, we all have differences of opinion. And believe me, getting to this point of having a main motion even as amended uh, required trying to have everyone's opinion understood as well as represented in the decision and I'm comfortable with where we are for the purposes of the first reading. I do hope that um, not only do we have a very um, fruitful conversation with the public at our public hearing, but we also, um, and we'll talk about the timeline regarding um, until we have the second reading, but I truly hope that we also reach out to our state representatives and encourage them strongly, very strongly, that they come to a resolution regarding educational funding in our state and what that impacts so that we understand what that impact is because for me that changes the dynamics of every amendment that has been proposed 
based upon the conversation that we've had. And one of the, the final piece that I want to um, add is that we all represent different constituencies. The fact is we're all voted in by different constituencies. There are some vexing and overlapping. I understand that. Um, I see it. I know of them in my own constituent group over the years. But the fact is, is that there isn't just about the people who voted no, it's about the people who voted yes, and we don't want to discourage them to vote no. And it's about finding that same balance in the next proposal and not going overboard. And so that's what I'm looking for, even though I described my own challenges. Uh, and by the way, I did make statements during the joint process in which I said in that joint meeting, you know, given the compromises that I made, the school department needs to take um, accountability and responsibility for that proposal. I've reached out to the manager, I've reached out to the superintendent and others and had that conversation. I've been told that that could happen. I'm not saying I'm going to, I'm going to support having 100% of it come out of the schools, but I've been told that the schools could. And I need to balance that based upon what I think this community needs, as well as I've been told that we could, even though with challenges, come up with the $71,000 out of the town's budget. It's a challenge because we've heard about we're not going to raid the paving account again or we're not going to do something. Um, but I also keep in context, overall this is a $92 million budget and to, for me to get bogged down about $71,000 is extremely challenging. $307,000 out of the school department isn't a challenge, it's important. And I'm gonna take that into consideration um, through that process. But I think that we need to be aware that we represent more than just a constituency that elected us or that we may still be in communication with. We represent the entire community and they expect us to find a compromise and a balance in our decisions and I think that we will. Um, I do appreciate the conversation that we've had tonight uh, because I think it's um, uh, significantly more orderly and um, more patient than it was at the second reading. So I appreciate everyone's work on that. Councilor Rowan? Yeah, I just, uh, while we're talking about this, I just wanted to point out that the, um, it was really, it was, I think it was May 4th that the Joint Finance Committee asked the uh, superintendent and the town manager um, to find additional reductions to get to, under, uh, to an under 3.5% tax increase. And they came back um, with some uh, recommendations that went to the Finance Committees and the, and the Joint Council. And I just wanted to remind everyone how, how painful some of those things were, uh, while were while we're making these additional cuts that we don't know how to do. Um, you know, the, I, the beach cleaning vote still haunts me. Mm -hmm. I regret that we have gone down to one beach beach cleaning, and I wish that um, I had handled that a little differently. Um, the, um, you know, I'm really unhappy that, that uh, we're asking parents to pay more for supplies, that we've eliminated budgets for field trips, um, that we cut um, the textbooks uh, funding, um, that we eliminated some professional development, um, that we took away a foster grandparent, um, that we um, are not hiring an unfilled math teacher position uh, who's retiring, um, and that we limited enrollment in the Summer Reading Academy. I think those are really material cuts um, in the educational experience, and I know that the superintendent did her level best um, to make them as, as um, mitigate the pain as much as possible, but I, I think that there was real uh, pain to get there. And so I think when we're talking about $307,000 that we still need to cut, that's a lot of money, um, and this is going to have um, real pain when we start talking about what, the, what it actually is. Councilor Paul. One clarifying and one comment. Uh, we're still going to discuss date, potential date change, correct? So that's in order number 17-064? Right. Okay. I just want to make sure that I didn't miss it because I can miss things sometimes. And secondly, I just want to also add and be clear, <coughs> one of my concerns in not wanting to share the split of the budget um, was a protective feature of me wanting to protect our superintendent because I really do think she's the real deal and people, I, I know people will disagree with that. She's got big shoulders and I, it's not my job, but I want her to stay. <laughs> um, and I think that's important and I'm concerned of the, the optics of everything, you know, of it not coming from the school, but we are where we are and we'll work through that. But I didn't, I forgot to mention that earlier, so I wanted to say that. Councilor Rowan. I'm sorry, I have one more point. I'm probably going to make it at the public hearing at the second reading also. Um, but it's something that is um, stuck in my craw. Um, I, um, there's a graphic on the internet. There is a, um, there's an ad in the Scarborough Leader. Um, I heard it tonight from the public comment. Um, and that's saying that 
uh, the net education budget is somehow the amount of taxes that we're paying for our schools. Um, the ad says that it's the taxes to be raised, um, suggesting that the taxes have to be raised to make up this difference. Um, but I want to point out that that would only be true if we had a stagnant, um, if we had a stagnant valuation and if property taxes were our only source of revenue. I want to point out that our non-education revenues are up $650,000. Our homestead exemption reimbursement is up $125,000. <coughs> our business equipment tax exemption is up, uh, reimbursement is up $40,000. Our state municipal revenue sharing is up $50,000 expected. I want to, I'm not sure I believe that one. Um, and then our, our property valuation growth uh, projected at $49 million generates $812 thousand dollars in new tax revenue um, and that valuation growth is the biggest factor in our declining GPA allocations um, and all of that together more than offsets the uh, increase in school funding thank you any other comments or questions so all in favor of the main motion as amended uh, please raise your hand. Um, actually do we need to No, it's first reading right. um, all in favor please raise your hand Three, that is unanimous. Thank you. What I would like to um, ask or suggest is that we take a, um, pre a brief recess uh, up to five minutes or as soon as I see seven councils returning. That way some of our guests could also leave if they would like. But So we are standing in recess for five minutes. Thank you. I heard uh, that I made about the increase in spending? Oh. Yeah. She wants the elevator, yeah. please.
Welcome back, everyone. We took a brief uh, recess, so, so we are back on our calendar and schedule. And that we are um, on order number 17-064. It is an act on the request to set the date, time, and location of the school budget validation referen referendum for Tuesday, July 18th, 2017. Is there any public comment on the action item? Not seeing any, we'll close the public comment. And is there a motion by the council? So moved. Second. And would anybody, uh, are there any amendments or any comments or any requests? Yeah. Council Sinclair. Um, I apologize, I don't have it right in front of me. Mm -hmm. I thought I had it on the hard copy. Um, I'd like to move approval to amend the main motion to set the date, time, and location of the school budget validation referendum for Tuesday, July 25th, 2017. This gives the public an extra week, which has been asked in abundance of the council over the last two days. Is there a second to the amendment? Second. Comments or questions? Councilor Rowan. Um, so um, I'm concerned uh, with changing the date and making it a week later. I know it's only a week. Um, and I just want to raise those concerns in that um, the sooner we can get a budget finalized, the sooner that the uh, uh, it, both administrations can uh, move forward on their budget. I know hiring is, is an issue. Um, I'm also concerned that we we're, could be headed to a third referendum. Um, and if we delay too much, that doesn't leave us a lot of, we run, quickly run out of summer. Um, However, I've also heard overwhelmingly the, that feedback. Um, so um, w in that feedback, I've heard that a lot of it is around um, having enough time with the budget. And so I guess I'd like to counter-propose that uh, we look at moving the second reading forward so that we're giving more time for absentee voting, more time with certainty. But if our second reading instead of July 5th was next week, um, it would provide an extra week of information uh, processing time. I just, uh, Chairman Baybine. Yes. I'd like to just make a clarification that I did speak with the superintendent and she reassured me that there would be no issues along the lines of hiring anyone by moving it to July 25th. Thank you. Well, Council Foley. So my, I was looking at a calendar today trying to figure out how we could do that and my concern would be then we don't have the opportunity to have the public hearing in between. Um, so wrong. Sorry, were you were you referring through Didn't the chair? Did you just say have yeah. second reading next week? My suggestion was to have public hearing and second reading both next week. Right. Public reading at the beginning of the week, and I'll I'll take your point about the um, hiring. In the same week, you're saying? I'm saying uh, keep them separate, uh, but in the same week. That's key, has it? So while finance didn't necessarily agree on the date, one thing we did come out of a consensus with was separating out public comment with, uh, excuse me, public hearing with second reading because uh, the, the perception is always that if they're held simultaneously that public comment isn't really taken into consideration for second reading. So while we didn't agree on the date, we did agree that splitting those two procedural issues out was important and I think um, while I, I, I don't know what an extra week of time is going to do because we're talking about 307,000 and 71,000, we're not talking about entire budget numbers. However, I'm willing to concede the fact uh, to, to get us through and, you know, gives people more time to buy signs, I guess. So I did want to make a, uh, just a notification is that um, Dude, public law on. does require that we provide public notice of a public hearing at least seven days prior. So having them together may not work. And we've already posted it. For this. And we've already posted it. Any other comments? Um, I'll just add is that, um, ironically, um, to some extent, I'm surprised I didn't get more input regarding the actual impact of the budget, but yet I got something like 75 emails regarding the date. I would think that if the if the public is truly tax conscious about the budget's impact that they would have given us input regarding uh, both the amount that we should, and by the way, now one person sent me an email saying that I need to keep a budget at 3%, at least I don't recall seeing it, but I got 75 emails about the date. So I'm a little bit uh, confused about the priority of importance, um, but I agree, I did get the 75, I respect that, and if that means that we move it to the 25th, 
absolutely happy to do so. Any other comments or questions? Councilor Rowan? I'd just like to say, taking all the input, I'm, uh, I'm going to turn around and support this. So I'm convinced. Well, well debated. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Any other comments? Yeah. All in favor of the motion? That is unanimous. Thank you. So we are actually returning to the main motion. Oh, I'm sorry. Main motion as uh, so. Um, every, um, any other comments on the main motion as amended? Not seeing any. All in favor? And that is unanimous as well. Thank you. So moving back to order number 17-060. It's an act on the request to authorize the town manager to expend monies from the public safety building capital improvement account for additional expenditures in the amount not to exceed $17,000 as recommended by the manager. The manager would like to give an overview before we have public comment. Yes, as part of the uh, order that created the Ad Hoc Public Safety uh, Building Committee, uh, you also authorized $50,000. Um, I think at the time I acknowledged that I wasn't sure if that was enough. In fact, we, we contracted with uh, an architectural firm uh, and they came in right at that number. Kind of curious. I suspect they were aware of what our budget was, but um, I have no misgivings whatsoever with the selection. They've been very good uh, at turning around and keeping on a fairly tight schedule. And as part of this process, we have identified some ledge and wetlands uh, in the area, and uh, it only made prudent sense to know as much as we can about that. It will inform the probable cost estimate, the siting of the building, and those sorts of things. So really between borings and additional wetland delineation costs, we have about a $17,000 additional expense for this initial phase. Um, and there certainly are adequate funds in the existing <coughs> reserve account. So this would authorize me to use those funds uh, to pay those bills. Um, public comment. Anybody in the public thought would, would like to comment? Not seeing any. Uh, council action. So moved. So moved. Second. Council Commons, Council St. Clair. Um, I just want to say it, it would actually probably be, oh, here's my favorite word, irresponsible to, to not ha allow this to happen. I'd hate to see us get further down the road on this site and planning process and be excited about this piece of land and then find out at the last minute that if we'd only invested a little bit up front, we wouldn't have gotten into such a mess. So I think it's really critical that we get this moving um, and allow the town manager to release these funds so that um, the group that's really working extremely hard on this um, can keep moving forward. Uh, Council Chiazzo? So two questions, if I could, through the chair for the, for the manager. Uh, first one is, is this the same group that was doing the plan for the municipal campus as well? No, this is uh, context, context architecture. Uh, they're really doing the, all the site work, uh, the space needs analysis, and now they've produced conceptual site plan and building uh, schematics. Uh, as part of that, they're doing as much as they can, uh, really through due, due diligence. Uh, siting of the building is important to understand the under uh, the geotechnical aspects of the property, and same would be said for ledge. So these are really subcontractors that we brought in to help us better understand the site challenges. So second question, if I could. Um, so is it, is it conceivable that based on their findings, we could need to relocate the position of the public safety building? Mm. It's possible, but yeah. uh, uh, the opinions have been informed right along. Uh, I, uh, Angela Blanchett, the town engineer, is here and has worked with the subcontractors uh, to perhaps answer that better. But um, I'm hopeful that we don't see a major change <laughs> in siting of the building at this point. Um, We've done um, the geotechnical work that we're referring to, looking at it in a couple steps and stages. And as Tom said, we've been kind of we've contracted through the town ourselves, so we've kind of had a control of that, let's say. And I've spent been there with them and going through that. Um, and it also looked at first we did, it, did more of a broad brush and saying, is it appropriate site? And now we're kind of honing in and getting more of a grid work on where that ledge is, which, which will really fine tune the budget cost. So we, right now it's just um, putting in allowances that may not be necessary. And when we're talking about really coming down with a cost to put in front of the council, um, we really want to have the best number we can. And spending that money up front, I think, will get us to a better number. And, and more information is always best in that case. 
Thank you. Yeah, I guess both, both both Kate and I are kind of liaisons to the group, and I've, we've been kind of following it. And I, I, I concur that this information is absolutely critical. To some of they're at this phase where moving the building a foot or two can make huge differences in site costs and some of the real costs they're struggling with. It's not only ledge, but it's the water table on the ledge that makes a big difference. So I would really hype. I think this is money well spent. Will mm -hmm. We could save m much more than this by making sure we just mm -hmm. move the retaining walls a little bit or whatever to avoid. They don't know exactly where the ledges are, and this will really help them pinpoint. There were some places they couldn't get to because um, there were some woods in the way and some other things. So I just it's, it's an unknown. So I, I would highly recommend that this is just a prudent step to move forward. Thank you. Great. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, Councillor uh, Foley. I mean, just given our previous conversation, I don't want to spend any money on anything, and I would, I'd give it to the schools if I could. But um, I also see the That's benefit fine. of uh, saving money later, doing it right the first time around. So I fully support it. Council Rowling. I think the worst thing that we could do would be to get really far into this and find out that we were two feet off with the building or that we have significant costs overrun. So I think the more information we can gather up front, the better. So I'm supportive. Council Donovan. I agree. agree. Oh. I think it's also important two two pieces of that to remember also is we're not this isn't just a, a building a normal structural building that we're building um, it's much more complex it's ho it's housing um, highly flammable things it's housing ammunition it's housing things that you're not going to find in a town hall or a house or a, another normal public building so there's a lot more that needs to go into the pre-planning of this building than we would normally s expect and this is not a this expense is not something that actually surprised me in the least bit so and also um, the funds are already there they're not we couldn't just give them it would be great if we could just give them to anybody but they're not they're actually there for this police department fire department um, just a kind of a joke or anecdotal. Um, I remember growing up in my hometown and they were planning a new bridge and um, they didn't do the proper planning and the bridge was actually built two feet short. So I think that in uh, uh, retrospective that this is obviously money well spent given the investment that we're going to make. So I support it as well. Any other comments? Can I just make one quick one? Um, I did get a couple questions um, in the planning of this. Um, a couple of parents actually were concerned that this was going to take away from the skate park that's over here, and that is not the case. The plan is to keep the skate park as is so that we would not be losing that. And the homes that are where the, those of you that voted and saw the plans um, and saw where the building is going to go, those properties, I also got the question about the properties that are there. We own those properties by the town, so there's no conflicts there. Um, and I think there were a couple of people that were happy to hear that we are planning on keeping the skate park as is. Any other questions? All in favor? And that is unanimous. Thank, Thank you. you. Next item is order number 17-061, act on the request to ratify the collective bargaining agreement between the Town of Scarborough and the Scarborough Professional Firefighters Association, IAFF Local 3894, as recommended by the town manager. Before public comment, if the town manager would like to give an overview. Uh, I certainly can. I'll, I'll give an introduction. Jacqueline Mandrake, the HR director, is here if you have detailed questions. Uh, but I, uh, for the first time during my tenure here, uh, the newly minted uh, Appointments and Negotiation Committee uh, did take this matter up. Unfortunately, this process was well on its way before that committee uh, took on that new charge, but this matter um, that's before you tonight did uh, stop with them last week, and it was discussed, um, and I believe there is you know, support of that committee to, to bring it forward to you. Um, just as a general comment, we are very pleased with uh, making some significant progress on medical insurance. We were able to do a couple of things um, that involve having a larger share, employee, sh employee share of cost, and also moving them to a, a different type of plan that's more cost effective for us and for them. Uh, those were tough things to bring to their attention and get them to ultimately agree to, and we're very pleased uh, to present that to you. If there are detailed questions, Jacqueline, you could perhaps answer those. Are there any questions from Council for our HR Director? Not seeing any. I'm just going to open it up to public comments. Anybody would like to speak? Not seeing any. Is there a motion from the Council? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Thank you.
Uh, comments and questions from council? The uh, treatment of insurance uh, was discussed uh, extensively at the Appointments and Negotiations Committee, and it was considered uh, a significant advancement uh, in the uh, interests of the town to have a more shared relationship with uh, uh, the cost of insurance. Yeah, and I just wanted to, to bring attention to the other councilors that this, this was really our first go around from an appointment standpoint to look at an, an, an actual contract. Um, I think we learned a lot. Um, you know, Chief Thurlow was certainly very thorough and, and uh, town manager was very thorough with their explanation. Um, and I, I think we've, you know, we're starting to build that knowledge and understanding of the process. And I think uh, moving forward, I think we'll be able to be able to kind of gather a lot more information and be able to present maybe a more thorough analysis to the council and we can start looking at strategies perhaps, you know, mm -hmm. longer term strategies for, for employment contracts. So very helpful and uh, fully support the contract. Um, I have um, in um, what I would call maybe a uh, brief statement um, through the manager, um, could you comment, how do we compare, how does our contract compare to either a peer group and I don't need to know what the peer group is, but whatever that peer group is that you look at and Jacqueline looks at, how do we compare? Well, I mean, there's so many different components. Um, and clearly, peer comparisons, I assure you, the unions are acutely aware of what mm -hmm. their colleagues in other communities are making, and that's very often the cornerstone of some of their proposals. Uh, I will tell you that I, I think what we're doing here with the medical insurance is a fairly big departure. And um, and for that, we're, we're really proud of it. Um, I, I've not studied these myself, but I know from the HR director and the fire chief, uh, from a salary point of view, we are kind of midpoint. We're, we're competitive. We're certainly not leading the pack. And uh, that presents some challenges. We're in a labor market, and we're uh, constantly trying to hire the best and the brightest. And so we need to be competitive. But I, I don't think we're out of line whatsoever. Great. Thank you. Any other comments? Not seeing any. Oh, Councilor Hayes. Yeah, I just think one general comment, I think it kind of piggybacks on what Councilor Chiazzo said that just as we sort of starting to look at this, I think we have identified some areas to look at and I think one area we did have conversations about is is a lot of our contracts are tied to coal and I'm actually kind of hearkening back to Ed Blaze who used to be a prior counselor that always had suggested that that might be something we just may want to look at and analyze and think about. So I just offer that that, that probably is belongs on some one of the committees and so just look forward to just having that kind of tabled up as something we should probably consider and take a look at for our strategy. Thank you. Other comments? Not seeing any. All in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Moving into item number eight, non-action items. Um, there are none. Um, item number nine, standing and special committee reports and liaison reports. I'll start with Councilor Donovan. Uh, we covered the appointment and negotiations committee uh, just a moment ago. Pest management committee met on June 14th. Uh, we have a new contract with a new provider of services for the field and uh, uh, lawn properties uh, of the municipality. There were some concerns expressed about it at the meeting. However, the town manager sent out a very extensive uh, uh, summary of where we have gotten to, where we're coming from, and our commitment to the program, and that was very well received by members of the Pest Management Committee, and I got to applaud the town manager on doing a very good job to answer every question that was asked. The Metro Regional Coalition met on June 13th, to focus entirely on the opiate addiction problem and how to have a coordinated re regional response. We'll be working on that through the summer and into the fall. The uh, Echo Maine annual meeting was held on June 15th. <clears throat> the uh, focus of Echo Maine's initiatives this year is on composting, and Scarborough and South Portland were featured uh, 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 and mentioned frequently uh, uh, as leading this effort uh, with their pilot programs. Uh, the Energy Committee met today, 7.30, I can't believe. They meet at 7.30. Uh, uh, extensive work on the um, draft uh, energy plan, part of the uh, updating the comprehensive plan. 
uh, uh, and uh, Kerry Grantham doing a very good job of leading that discussion. Uh, public safety building update uh, w was uh, uh, given, site select uh, selected, cost estimates being uh, developed, uh, public outreach session uh, just held, uh, although few public attendees uh, was, the, was the report given. LED streetlight update uh, that uh, uh, South Portland, Portland, Falmouth are really leading the way on that, Bitterford and Rockland, uh, and that we are in the RFP draft stage so that a draft RFP uh, is being developed uh, and being circulated at the staff level. Uh, and so there will be more on that in the months to come. Uh, there was uh, 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 mention made of a citizen's climate lobby, uh, uh, which uh, is part of uh, uh, the way town, cities, and states have been reacting to the withdrawal or the threat of withdrawal from the Paris Accords. Uh, and uh, I made mention of the fact that the United States Climate Alliance formed by Washington, New York, and California uh, is something that I've been looking at uh, uh, but uh, and working with the Larissa Crockett on, but haven't really made any reference uh, yet because uh, I don't know what the level of commitment is or whether there's any cost involved, and I did not want to uh, bring it really for any formal action uh, before the Ordinance Committee or the Town Council until I knew a lot more uh, about it. But hundreds of towns and cities are signing on to the United States Climate uh, Alliance uh, and another dozen states have joined Washington, New York, and California. Uh, and I'm sure people have read about it in the newspaper. Uh, that's it. Uh, Councilor Rowan? Yep, so the 55-plus uh, 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 Community Services um, Oversight Committee met um, we actually met over at Martin's Point um, with um, some members of the Martin Point staff. It's a beautiful facility. It was my first time in there. Um, can't express enough how appreciative we are and what a, what a tremendous impact that's had on the, the participation numbers for that program. Um, there were a couple things discussed. Um, Todd Souza, um, our new uh, Director of Community Services, was there. Um, he um, let us know that um, community services, excuse me, the, the minibus uh, did not pass inspection. Um, and luckily there was a enough uh, in there, and they had it in the capital plan for next year. Um, so uh, in the capital plan this year, they had a truck with a plow, um, and the numbers worked out well. Um, they got a really nice deal on a, on a truck, uh, 2016, um, minibus um, from Bluebird um, that was driven down and delivered a couple weeks ago um, and they're really happy with the flexibility of the, the members of the committee that had ridden in it were really happy. It, it can accommodate um, more wheelchairs as needed. Um, seats can be uh, moved around um, and they're really, really pleased with it. Um, the other thing that we discussed was the um, uh, community gaming area which uh, if you recall was part of the budget uh, cycle last year where we set aside $100,000 for some, some place to put um, uh, some senior recreational facilities. Um, it was um, initially thought that maybe they'd put that where the skate park is, and, and, um, when, and there were a number of reasons why that wasn't a great idea. Um, the most important of which is that that wouldn't happen until the uh, later, and they, there's been a lot of um, excitement around getting something built sooner. And so, it's, so Todd had gone back with his staff and come up with a with a plan for what they might do in Memorial Park and had presented a draft of over by where the, where the um, oh, this is great television, I know, um, but over where the, uh, where the bathrooms are in Memorial Park, put in a couple pickleball courts. Um, those, that's really the only like permanent structure. Everything else could be moved around and this is kind of a conceptual not to scale, scale drawing, but it has uh, pickleball, horseshoes, bocce, croquet, a couple of chess tables, um, cornhole boards, and he said these were like 700 pound cornhole boards that so they're not, no one's going to be running off with them. Um, don't take that as a challenge. Um, <laughs> and uh, um, otherwise, there was a, a decision that the next meeting would be to talk about, like, what to do about membership, membership structure, because um, that's a hot topic of debate there. That's all I have. Councilor Foley? Um, yeah, not a lot. Um, 
my apologies to the Conservation Commission. I did miss that meeting, but uh, I know that they were extremely pleased that there was unanimous support of the uh, solar uh, bill that was in front of in Augusta this week. There is talk, uh, and Bill already touched on it, so I don't need to go into it um, amongst that group as well, though, around the Climate Alliance and you know where where we can go as a town in terms of supporting that. So th that'd be the only thing. Uh, Councilor Sinclair. Um, I just have uh, communications. I just wanted to thank uh, Councilor Foley, Councilor Chiazzo, and Councilor Hayes, who all, and I was there too, took turns. Um, we had covered the entire election um, at a table full of a lot of information. I was actually, I think we gathered, I don't know, 300 to 400 emails um, to be able to put into the database for the newsletter, which is fabulous. And we also got to talk to a lot of people, which I think was good, too. Um, sometimes they were surprised to see that we were counselors sitting there. They were sort of, that sometimes made people run away, but that was okay. Um, but a lot of people stopped and picked up pamphlets and information, and it was, it was, really, it was really great. I think the, the sad part about it, um, and this is truly from a, from a communication standpoint, um, was that watching the people that were coming in and out, it was definitely our senior citizens and I sat there feeling really frustrated um, and wondering and I and I talked actually talked to Julie who actually came down and, and watched some of it happening and thought how do we how do we reach more of these parents and engage them to come in and vote and it was it was frustrating that not speak speaking for the school, not speaking for the school board, but speaking and watching how much work that they put into and how much advocating they do for our kids and how much work we all do, and then to sit there for an entire day and watch the whole election unfold, it, it can, it's frustrating at times. Um, and, and whatever way you vote is the way that you vote, but this is your town. These decisions are being made, and if you don't go and vote, you don't have a say. And that's, it, this is where you really can make an impact. A lot of people say, oh, I can't make an impact when I at the national level. Well, maybe you feel that way, but I'm telling you, at the local level, you really can make an impact. And we really saw that that day. So um, communications-wise, it was a great day for us, but it was also a, a, a disappointing day in some, in some ways. But I do really appreciate the help that day. Um, and we are planning um, a focus group um, for the communications committee. We, we've been doing the roundtables, which have been well-received, but we're going to try to do a more focus group um, concerning the budget and since we have been getting some feedback we're hoping to get some some more people involved in that process and try to get more input input as to how we can proceed going forward how we, how we do that better so that's it yeah a couple things um, finance committee I handed out two documents um, the first page of the document we've kind of we've worked a little bit and how can we provide information that's meaningful and actually have worked with staff and actually have come up with, we're calling up the executive summary. So it's just kind of a one pager about the financial statements. It's for the period ending March 31st and it just kind of gives you what's, what's positive, what's negative. Um, the good news is we're tracking sort of where we, we set, thought we we're going to be from a budget perspective. The good news is just a highlight. Um, the town did maintain our bond rating, um, which is great, on two different indexes and actually when we went to borrow money, we actually could borrow at an, you know, favorable rates that saved us about $200,000 and we had a finance. So, so anyway, give, give us some input. This is, this is probably what we're thinking about might be helpful just to kind of give you a snapshot of where we are. Secondly, the other document we have is this kind of two page and actually, Clarissa has done a lot of great work. We've been, you know, this work started about a year ago under, under Sean's leadership around really trying to develop some metrics we can share. Uh, maybe a snapshot once a year that kind of talks about some different metrics we think might be interesting for the town to track. In particular, there's some things in here around debt, which we've been getting a lot of questions from some members of the community about debt and what does it mean and how do we compare. Um, this is kind of a work in progress, what we intend to do now. This is just sort of the metrics we've chosen. Um, we've asked staff to go back and give us sort of estimates of what are sort of benchmark ranges for some of these things so we can kind of tell whether we're in a safe zone or a, you know, sort of a red light, yellow light, green light. So this is a work in progress, but I just thought I'd share those two documents with you. If you have any questions 
Um, the full financial statements are out under the agenda for the Finance Committee, if anybody's interested. Um, there was a public safety, I think, uh, Councilor Donovan mentioned. They did have an open house on 614. They showed people around the station. It was a light turnout, but it actually was a good turnout. They actually did sort of focus groups. They had table that asked questions about it, things that, and that's been sort of embedded and put into where frequently asked questions to kind of help with the conversation. Um, the um, Shellfish Commission, I will say that they, uh, there's an open invitation for anybody. They're killing crabs on 9 o'clock on 628. So if somebody wants to show up at the co-op and go out, and I guess they just, I don't know, I think they take sledgehammers and they go out and they, it's, but anyway, they, it's an open invitation for anybody that wants to experience. But um, the Shellfish Commission meeting, um, <coughs> it's, it, 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 Oh yeah, they they step on them. They they why? Because they they're predators. For the they, clams, they, so these are the green crabs. Crab. Green crabs. Oh, green I thought crab, you were talking about like crabs like that. We would no. you know. No, no green crabs. They, they why would anyone want to do that? But they they do. Not they go they go on these nighttime yeah. hunts. Every I'm tired. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, so they, that was an open invitation. But more importantly, and, and Tom joined with with the town attorney is um, agricultural leasing is becoming a big issue up and down the coast. Um, we're discovering actually the state has the authority to grant some of those leases. Um, there may or may not be a lot the town can do about it. The shellfish really is trying to get organized and there may be some ordinances coming forward about how can they at least protect us as best we can so that there's some local decision making on where the leases are and how much land and how they're structured. But it was a highly um, interesting meeting. There was a variety of viewpoints. They're a very interesting group. Um, there, there's some that feels like they, they don't think it's an issue and don't, you know, just kind of want the Wild West and do whatever they want to do. Others are trying to be planful about the resource. So I don't know where it's going, um, but that's kind of a work in progress and we'll be coming back. Uh, the Coastal Harbor Met, um, they are working on, I guess there were two things that they did talk about. They've done sort of a, a site improvement for down at the co-op for parking for commercial fishermen and recreational users and other things. They have come up with a plan. They had planned that some of the work might be done by early summer. It looks like it's going to be out in time, but they're kind of monitoring that. And they're starting to, to take a look at, I guess there's just a lot of moorings on the books. Um, no one really knows who they are, so they're starting the process of trying to clean that up. So with that, I think that's sort of the, the landscape for me. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so Long Range Planning met on June 9th. Um, we did uh, two basic things. We discussed the preliminaries for the Higgins Beach Open House that was held on June 11th to discuss some slight modifications to the character code. Uh, they looked at a few, tweaking a few things to kind of get it more in line with what the uh, intention of the code was. And they had a public uh, open house, if you will, on June 11th at the Higgins Beach Community Club. Uh, very well attended. The consultants were there as well. and. Uh, very, very positive feedback from the community, very pleased with the outcome, and I think uh, Long Range Planning is going to look at the wording and, and make some minor suggestions or corrections, and then it should be coming back to Council for final approval here, with hopefully within the next few weeks. Uh, also looked at the comprehensive plan um, and how Long Range Planning was going to be the hub for that. One of the things that came out of that, which I thought was very helpful, is they're going to move to a two-meeting system. So we're going to have, th they're, they're planning on having an evening meeting and having meetings at multiple different times to discuss only long-range planning, or excuse me, only comprehensive plan updates. So we'll have regular long-range planning work that's done in the normal committee, but then they'll have separate public meetings, if you will, uh, to discuss the work, the ongoing work that they're doing for the comprehensive plan. So that was kind of a way to help keep the community engaged and do that work as, as openly and as transparently as possible. And, also looking at maybe different times to try and accommodate as many different schedules as possible at various times. So still a work in progress, but I think it's a good, it's a good step forward in terms of keeping the, uh, the transparency there. Uh, transportation hasn't met yet. Um, I wanted to mention to Councillor Hayes, I, I heard an article or heard something on the radio a couple days ago about they're making pastries now out of green crabs. So <laughs> perhaps we could, uh, we could smash them. We could sma we'll, we'll, we'll bring you some samples. We'll, yeah. Yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll yeah. smash them this year, but maybe next year we could look at that as an alternative yeah. revenue stream. And then yeah. You can take that sample. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, you know, hey, you know, it's, it's what's good for the goose, right? right. Um, and the Council Rowan, um, quick question, was the concept or the possibility of a, a student liaison discussed oh. as well? 
And if so, could you please provide a quick update? I, my apologies, uh, passed unanimously. So very support, Excellent. very much support to, to add okay. that. And I uh, was remiss and apologize. That's right. No, no, we're just checking in. So that, that's all I have. Thank you. Uh, can I ask for clarification? Um, liaison to what? Uh, so there's, uh, I've been please. trying to work together with the, the schools and the senior committee to, to put a student senior representative right. on the senior committee to have that kind of liaison uh, between the, the schools and the seniors group. So it's, it's, everybody has been very supportive. We just now have to do the work to get it there. So. 55 plus. 55 plus, excuse me. Thank you. Um, for the chair, there's only a couple of items. First is, um, it's primarily around workshops. So as of tonight, um, based on the amendment uh, for the budget, uh, we need to schedule a town council workshop um, in order to discuss the um, appropriation or the uh, adjustments that are recommended at least at first reading. The question is, um, when is everyone's schedule available to have that workshop? Council Rowan? I'm wondering if we could do it uh, in advance of the public hearing. I mean, do we need to do it? So public hearing is next Wednesday. Could we do it right before that, or does it need to be, like, do you think it needs to be Monday or Tuesday, or Thursday or Friday this week? So um, that is up to you, because it's, you know, we can make that decision as a group. I will say is that, just to keep in mind, it, um, at a public hearing when it's outside of a, a regular meeting, it's solely a public hearing, so there is no conversation or debate or um, a anything regarding that. So generally speaking, that is how it's, that is the only item on the meeting agenda. I but that does not mean that we cannot have that before, yeah. because I would think that people would at least be watching it early, maybe, if we give that an announcement. Um, but, you know, I can tell you that is the only day next week that works for me. Well, we uh, just, if I could chime in, there is a long-range planning meeting at 7 o'clock. That's the first community one that they wanted to do for comprehensive planning. Obviously, this is, takes precedent over that, but I just wanted to inform council. Okay. I don't so know where it's... We're aware of that. Okay. That we'll be sharing the space, unfortunately. That's, that's what we're facing. I didn't hear what day you were talking about. It's 28th. June 28th. Which is the public hearing. That's the best day for me. I mean, I have a couple other possibilities, but, but it's tight. So that's the best day for me. So if there's no objection, we'll go ahead and schedule the workshop for next Wednesday 6 p.m. at 6 p.m. And then last, just for notification purposes, um, we did cancel the, um, uh, the workshop on goals, um, given our current priority for the budget. So um, don't need that decision this evening, because it's um, given the budget, that's a priority. But I will be in touch on what date might work, probably <coughs> in August. But we do need to check in on that. So <coughs> keep that in mind. With that, um, town manager's report. Yes, very, very quickly. Uh, I advise the council that uh, the public might be interested Tonight, we were supposed to have a, uh, another workshop on Avenue 2 uh, at the, really the request, not the request, but um, the concurrence of all the parties. Uh, they thought that they should have a little more time to kind of work on the issues. Uh, there was a very productive site walk last week at which eight residents attended. A representative from the Gables condominium group was there, as was Mr. Gender and his staff or his consultants. Uh, and by all accounts, uh, everyone thought it was very worthwhile and wanted to do some more work. So I will stay in touch with them, and I think it makes perfect sense to allow them to kind of work through their issues and get to some logical end, wherever that might be, and bring it back to you when, when they've kind of worked through it. Uh, from a personal perspective, uh, we have conducted second round interviews for planning director. That was held late last week. And I expect by the end of this week, I will have a, a decision. Uh, I'm really challenged by some very good final candidates. Uh, it's a good problem to have, uh, but I'm sorting through um, the pros and cons of each of those final candidates. And as regards uh, HR director, I, uh, Jacqueline must have just uh, slipped out. Uh, that position does close the first week of July. I forget the exact date. But I've been monitoring day by day the applicants, and I'm very, very pleased with the, uh, the, the pool of applicants that's in so far, and I hope to get some more. So I'm very encouraged with that. Um, and I guess the final piece, and we don't need to decide it now, but I heard a lot of conversation before the meeting that the new uh, Chromebooks that you're working with are challenging. Um, <laughs> And so uh, that's not a surprise. We'd like to potentially schedule some follow-up training now that you have experience and maybe some more inquisitive questions as to how do you do what. 
So if that interests you, we can I'll work with council chair to find some time to do that. I guess the final piece, if, if possible, um, we need to grab about 10 or 15 minutes of your time, ideally on the 28th before the end of July, uh, June, uh, for some stormwater training. Uh, you might recall we work under a federal permit and the elected official training annual training is an important part of that permit. Uh, it's a very short bit of time, so if we can, we might try to grab a little time on the 28th. It's going to be a busy night, but um, I'll work with the council chair in that regard. Thank you. Is this new? Uh, as of two years ago, we have a, a federal permit that we work under, um, and elected official training is one of the many requirements under that permit. Um, I assure you it won't take much of your time. I can't unplug a toilet. Do you think I'm going to be able to stop something with stormwater <coughs> training? Depends on your plunger. <laughs> Prepare to be amazed. I think. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, I'm getting a little quirky here at 10 o'clock. But thank you. Is that it? Yes. Oh, um, member comments. Council Chiazzo. Yeah, so um, this is a tough one for me. And uh, first of all, I, I, um, while I, I, I may um, seem very passionate, at, at, especially during debates, I, I try and pride myself on my non-emotional responses to things. And uh, I do have to apologize to the town manager. I did let my emotions get the best of me on Thursday. And uh, uh, it's been a long, long five years, so I do want to apologize for for that, um, I, I don't know where to begin. I mean, I don't know, I just don't know how we got to this point again. You know, we're the, we're the only community in Southern Maine that didn't pass a budget. And I don't think it was because of negligence or dereliction of duty or anything that we did. We worked really, really hard this year, harder I think than we ever have. Collaboratively, we, we, we came to compromises. We did everything that we thought was right. And at the end of the day, you know, it, it came down to, you know, uh, some, in my opinion, and this is my opinion and why I'm saving it for, for counselor comments, a basic misinformation campaign, you know. And, you know, and, and I don't say that lightly. And the reason I don't say that lightly is because, you know, there was an article that came out in the Press Herald on June 15th, and I think it says it all. Um, I'm going to break protocol a little bit because this is public knowledge, and I'm not, these are not my comments, these are public comments. But in that article, dated June 15th, Steve Hanley says a 3.4% budget increase is not unreasonable. Another quote, very selective on how the budget, school budget was portrayed, and that's what their opposition was. And then he went on further to say he didn't know how much the school budget should be reduced or exactly where cost cutting should be done, and said I can't put a number to that. That's frustrating to me. That's frustrating to me not just because of the amount of time and effort and energy that we as counselors put into this. But it's frustrating to me that something like this, we allow as a community, something like this, to derail this process for us. I've been working on this stuff for five years now, and ev I, I thought last year we were making progress. And collectively as a council, I believe we're making progress. I just don't know why the, the community can't adopt that process. I don't know what we're missing. It feels like we're doing everything right, and instead of being rewarded for that, we get punished for it. So, you know, I, I really hope that, that the dynamics in this community can change, and that we can start putting community ahead of personal issues and personal needs. We were a community for a reason. You know, I, I, I honestly believe the one town, one budget approach is a great concept. It's real. It's our town. We can't silo things anymore because everything is a symbiotic relationship. We all rely on each other for everything in town. And we have to start making that adjustment as a community and start looking at this stuff holistically as what's right for our community, not what's right for my neighborhood or what's right for my house or what's right for me. And, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying that to dismiss the concerns that are out there. They're real. I understand them. I knocked a lot of doors in two campaigns. I've seen it. And we as a council recognize that. We're, we're putting efforts into tax relief, focused tax relief. Those are real efforts, and they're necessary, and they're important. But that 7.4% was never on the radar screen. It wasn't even an issue that we talked about. Because if it was, if it was a goal of ours, we would have addressed it. We would have talked about it. We would have discussed it. It was never discussed. We were focusing on the tax rate, which is what our job was. And we said 3.4. We were clear. We were adamant. 
over and over again. This is the imp this is the bill that you get. This is your cost for participation. And everybody said, you know what? Great compromise. That's great. Good job. But you lose. So I, I don't know what the answer is. We got a, we got a tough road. You know, there's no easy solutions. It, the, you know, I think you know. I, I think Peter said it best when he said, you know, we're going to have to make some real tough decisions as a town. And I was hoping that we could do them next year. I was hoping that, you know, we could put some of that pain off. But I, I think we're there now. We're there now. It's going to hurt. It's not going to feel good. And I wish it did. <laughs> it would be easy for us to make easy decisions and, and pick low-hanging fruit. There's no more fruit. <laughs> you know, there's, there's nothing. We, this is, we're now into a decision where, I agree, there's no room in the municipal budget for this stuff. There's no room in the school budget for this. But elections have consequences. And, and until the community recognizes that those consequences are across the board, not just the school's consequences or the town's consequences or the, the, you know, the, 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 the county's consequences, there are consequences. And, you know, I just, I, I'm at a loss. I, I, don't know, I don't know how to effectively respond without letting my emotions get the best of me. So, um, so I, I do apologize for that, and, and I, I hope we can continue the, the positive work that we've, I think we've done, and I know it's difficult for us, but I think as, as leaders, I think we're, we're up to the task. I really do, and, and I, I, hope we can, I hope we can get there. Hopefully. Wow. <laughs> um, kind of continuing that theme, I think um, I think we are at interesting times. I mean, I think when you look at the country and where we are, we've lost the ability to really have civil and respectful dialogue. And I think, and I, and I think sometimes, and I, and I think the superintendent has said it perfectly. Sometimes this isn't a sprint. This is going to be more of a marathon. And I, I do agree with Councilor Chiazzo. I think I think. We're trying to lead in a certain direction. We're just not having everybody follow us. And I think that is the million dollar question is why aren't they following us? And I think we need to have the intellectual curiosity to invite those in that are following us and do some type of process. And I think the survey is a great start. It starts to define for us maybe what those things are. But we, I, I, I look at ourselves as being we're supposed to represent everybody, every voice that's out there. So as this budget is going to be tough, there are no easy answers. I really encourage anybody that's listening, anybody out there, I want to hear everybody's point of view. Because I feel my job sitting at this table is I have to represent everybody's point of view in this community and try to find out what the majority view is and then try to put things in place. So I encourage anybody, please, let me know what you're thinking so at least I can make an informed decision. And I think, and I think that, that conversation about a sprint versus a marathon, I think there's been some positives. I mean, I think we spent a lot of time trying to change a different relationship the way we work together as a group. I've heard some saying, now, now next year the focus should be how do we partner with our community? To answer your question, how do we partner with our community to get their voices to start following what we're trying to do? I don't think this is anybody's fault. I don't think anybody's right or wrong. I think we have divergent opinions. We have a very diverse community. We need to find out how to work together. And so I, I'll leave it at that. But please, everybody, let us know what you think, because we can't make great decisions without knowing what the majority of you want us to do out there. Councilor Sinclair. I'm good. Said enough. Councilor Foley. <clears throat> Oh, I've probably said enough too, but uh, why not go into some more? Uh, actually, I want to talk about the um, the rescue of Higgins Beach um, yeah. last week. Uh, I happened to be there, and it was I have to tell you, it was quite scary. Um, I was sitting there talking with some friends, and and these two young girls approached me and said, "Hey, um, you know, these guys are out there on a raft, and their friends left them, and they asked us to watch them, and can you keep an eye on them?" And I l looked up and I said, "Where's the raft?" And I had seen them earlier. And the uh, the raft was nowhere. To, I mean, they were going. I said, "Oh, we can't keep an eye on them. We need the police right now because they're, there's no way they're coming back." Um, and so I immediately ran, found the officer on the, on the beach. Uh, at the same time, a fisherman was reporting it. So I wanted to commend those two girls um, mm -hmm. for bringing that to my attention, Hanya Phillips and M J Boyce. Um, I also want to commend the two brave paddleboarders who went out. Uh, I, my understanding is our harbor master was actually in a meeting at town hall. So in order to 
leave here, get to his boat, and get all the way out there, it was about a 45-minute delay, not his fault, um, but a delay nonetheless. So thank goodness that we had just a couple of really strong paddle boarders who were, because that's no easy feat. I mean, even going out there and going against the current and everything else. So um, I don't only have the name of one of them. It was Richard, and I'll probably butcher the last name, Vald Menes. Um, but anyway, wanted to thank them. That was It was uh, really brave because on shore all you could see was the raft flipping in the air and everybody on shore was going, oh my God, are they on the raft? We couldn't, we didn't have binoculars. So anyway, a harrowing experience um, and uh, glad it all turned out well. Uh, in regards to conversation tonight, um, I think tonight was a lot better than a few weeks ago and I appreciate everyone's willingness to um, move that uh, forward in, in a more productive debate uh, way. I, I share Councillor Chiazzo's passion, um, but I do think I always look in the mirror and I, I think there are things that we could have done better and that we have to own. One of the things that I keep hearing is about, the, you know, well, people were misled by these signs. And it bothers me for a few reasons. Um, I, first of all, I didn't like the signs myself. However, when you tell somebody that they've been misled, in essence, I feel like you're calling them stupid because they don't know any better. They were easily swayed. And I talked to a lot of people uh, in the last, since the election, and they were pretty clear on what they voted on. Um, so I, I'm not saying the signs didn't have some influence. It certainly had some influence. But I don't think, you know, we could pick apart a million things, you know. We added some hot button issues at the last minute. Did those have an influence? I don't know. There's a lot of things. What I want to do and I think is most productive is move forward. What happened happened. Let's learn from it, but let's move forward. Because I, I don't want us to keep doing this cycle. And I think that means listening more and more deeply um, and more often and in more ways. So that would be my anecdote for that. Uh, and last but not least, um, oh, I would also add, I was also very frustrated by the comments of, I don't know what the number is. You know what? If you're going to go out there and make that comment, then give us a number and give us something to work with. So I would share that sentiment as well. And that's one person, though. And I think I feel we're giving one person much too much power, but that's just my opinion. Happy first day of summer. <laughs> Kids are out of school. Uh, hope it's a warm one. Hope there's a lot of sunshine and be safe. Councilor Rowan. Um, so I, w I wasn't going to go into the um, signs uh, and the robocalls and the ads, um, but um, I talked to a lot of people um, and when they didn't know what the signs meant, they they were they were filling in the blanks incorrectly. Um, and driving by those signs, I I feel like there were a lot of people that were making the wrong assumptions when they saw them. Um, and I think that um, you know, at best, the signs were misleading, um, and um, at worst, they were intentionally deceptive. And and the wording of the ad, I, I also have concerns with, um, I mean, I just feel like it's a, it's a shame that we're there. Um, um, I, I did get a chance to go to the, um, the building co committee um, presentation at, at the public safety building. I wish there had been more people there. I think the thing that I walked away from was that having people see that building um, really convinces them of the need. Um, so uh, Chief Moulton and Chief um, Thurlow have offered tours to anyone that shows up. Um, or at least that's what uh, what they said. So we'll see if they uh, anyone calls them out, uh, takes them up on that. Um, but um, but it was really effective and it was really exciting to to see. There was a lot of thought put into the design of that building, um, if just from like future expansion and um, um, just really thoughtful from traffic flow all the way to you know how things are laid out and and uh, public space. Um, it's, um, it's I, I encourage anyone to, to get a hold of that presentation and, and um, look at it because it's it's really was really exciting to see. Um, uh, lastly, I wanted to thank uh, Councilor St. Clair um, and uh, the other councilors that that went to the table at the at the voting booth. I think that that goes a long way, and I appreciate you guys doing it. I certainly wasn't able to, uh, but um, but thank you. Um, I think it was important. That's all. 
Councilor Donovan. Uh, just a couple, one thing really. Uh, congratulations to the Scarborough High School girls softball team on its state championship, which I thought was terrific. Uh, and to the Scarborough High School boys outdoor track team on their state championship. And both of these programs are powerhouse programs, have dominated uh, uh, their A divisions for a number of years, and congratulations to Scarborough High School. I'm sorry, I have one more plug. Um, what we did learn on Election Day was that the original link to sign up for the e-newsletter uh, via the town's website was not working. So there were months where people were signing up and they weren't actually receiving the e-newsletter. Um, so if that affected you, please uh, visit the link again. It is now corrected uh, and it is now working. So um, we did add quite a significant number of people that day. And you know, again, more information, more ways, all is going to be good. <laughs> uh, just a couple of items. First, um, you know. Over the years, what is rewarding is um, both seeing, uh, seeing, feeling, and um, hearing the passion that we all have for the work that we do and um, the concerns that we have for the community as a whole. And hence why, I've, even if on the opposite spectrum that I'm on, I've always respected every council that I've worked with because of that passion. So, Chris, I really do appreciate um, your comments because um, I've seen a very wide spectrum of passion over the last 18 years, and um, I, I completely agree with you. Um, I'm a little challenged um, in the sense here we are at first reading after a significant uh, rejection of our budget, and we had, at best, if I count it right, six people that were here regarding the budget. Um, and again, I get 75 emails regarding uh, the date in which we're going to have the second reading. Um, but yet I received nothing regarding um, the actual amount that we should be spending, um, whether it's a dollar value for the schools or a percentage or even a percentage of the overall. So to me, there's a mixed message in that intellectual dialogue that we're looking for um, because there are plenty of invitations now for them to participate. Um, it's not that we're closed door or that we're not willing to have that conversation. Um, you know, one of the things, um, so by the way, I, I have to actually travel to Waterville this evening. Um, because I'm uh, the director, state director for the Boys State Program, uh, which is an American Legion program, and so that's going on this evening. Uh, the great piece is that uh, the governor, uh, Governor Pace, is there, and I'm not going back to an emergency situation as I did a couple of years back uh, when he spoke to the young men and uh, made some suggestions. So um, maybe I'll take some time. But you know, one of the one of the speakers we had was actually Terry Hayes. So I actually got to participate because we had the young men participate in the civil discourse conversation that she provided even in this community, and I did receive my pen as part of that. You know, and one of the things that it talks about, and I think it's conveniently forgotten, is that there is a responsibility to also call out when that civil discourse um, goes in the wrong direction. And for some reason in this situation, when we bring up and identify that as part of this campaign of no, we're told that it's not appropriate or that we need to be mindful of them, but yet in the reverse, um, there is no conversation. The fact is, is that what gets me emotional about this issue and why I have that pendulum swing is that there's really three pieces to the emotionalness of, of this and why I agree about the misstatements. And I think it's intentional. First are the signs. Um, I think that it was done purposefully. And the reason is that if you actually look at the history of the conversation around our budget, every year they're not consistent with the message that they send because they change it in order to shape the conversation to their benefit. Second is the robocalls that occurred as a result of it. Again, I got one of those calls, and it was intentionally misleading. I heard it, I heard it myself. And then third, on top of that, I hear from community members in which, who are living in 55-plus communities in which they are threatened by their landlord that if they, don't, if they pass the budget, their rent is going to go up. That's intentional. That needs to be called out. And it needs to be recognized. I have no problem having the debate that 3.49% is too high. I respect that. I understand it. We violated our own goal. But that wasn't the conversation. And one person commented in the Portland Press Herald that 3.49% was not unreasonable. So if we're going to have an intellectual conversation, let's at least get on the same page and be honest with each other on where we're starting, not changing the conversation so it's convenient. So, you know, um, I understand it. The problem that I don't get is 
um, we're not getting the support from the community, um, you know, and so where do we go? Uh, I, get, I get the frustration too because I've never seen this community, and maybe it's the way that it's structured, you know, that when the law did change, I think it was in 2008, mm -hmm. maybe that's the problem as a result of uh, Pulaski or whatever it was back in that, those days. Um, maybe that's the challenge, but I hope that if anything, the first thing that needs to be done is that we need to reach out to our state representatives because we need a decision by the state regarding the state's budget and its contribution to education and what is Scarborough going to get. I'm okay with understanding if we're not going to get any money, fine, make that decision so that we know where we're starting from. Uh, but let's stop playing games and we can then have the argument about why that is considering that Scarborough, from what I understand from uh, talking to the state treasurer, is probably one of the top ten if not top five communities that contribute the most to the state of Maine regarding income, sales tax, BETE, all of those tax brackets that we were promised to get back, but yet we're getting nothing for education. So, you know, we need to look at the priorities um, as it relates to that in particular. So, um, I'm looking forward to the conversation. I'm open um, and amenable to finding that compromise because I think it's important to the community as a whole, but we do need to have a reaction. And this type of behavior that's bringing us to this point needs to stop. And people need to understand that they are contributing to this problem. And I think they're doing it intentionally. And that's not what this community is about. So I hope it changes. I'm going to, I personally want to contribute to the continued dialogue and getting us moving forward. But um, someone has to call this type of, type of behavior out. It just absolutely does not represent Scarborough. And when you go to other communities, it's like, I can't believe, you live in Scarborough? And it's like, why can't you get it done right? We try. So I, I want to say thank you to the counselors. I think tonight went very well regarding the budget. It was a very complicated process in the sense that I tried to represent in that process everyone's individual opinion based on the conversations that I had. Um, I hope you're appreciative of that, and I think that we can move forward and really come up with a solution. So thank you, and I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. That is unanimous.